Good morning. Um, uh, I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist and a critical care physician at the Montreal Heart Institute. This is my uh, disclosures. I am supported by the Heart Institute Foundation. And uh, this presentation is summarized in this uh, uh, paper we wrote uh, last year. So uh, this is a 78-year-old uh, man undergoing aortic valve replacement. Uh, what you have in red is the femoral, in pink the radial artery pressure. Brain saturation is uh, shown here. Uh, after cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, brain saturation is completely normal, but you can see a significant gradient between the radial and the femoral artery pressure. Uh, this is another case, a patient undergoing aortic surgery, and in this patient we use two radial artery, and what you can see here, the significant difference between the femoral and the two radial artery pressure in this uh, situation. So, Seeing this, do you really trust radial artery pressure? In fact, I would say at the Art Institute, we don't. We don't trust it because this phenomenon that we call the significant radial to femoral artery pressure gradient, by significant we mean a 25 systolic difference or 10 as a mean, occurs about one third of all our cardiac patients for at least an hour. So when you see those, uh, this is probably a much more serious problem uh, than we think, and it's also present in the intensive care unit. So this is the plan of the presentation. So th the concept of untrust radial artery pressure in cardiac surgery is not something new. It's been described several years ago. This is uh, pre-bypass radial and aortic. And post-bypass, you can see a huge difference between the aortic and the radial artery pressure. And uh, this, uh, the authors conclude that radial artery pressure does not reflect the central aortic pressure in the immediate post-bypass period. And those observations have been made all over the world by several centers showing exactly the same phenomenon. This is our most recent study. It was a prospective study where we record electronically all these uh, measurements. In that study, we measured the size of the radial artery pressure. And you can see that if this, you have a small radial artery, less than 1.8 millimeter of mercury, you're going to have about 50% about of patients having significant radial femoral artery pressure gradient as opposed to if it's more than 2.2 millimeter. So those gradient can occur from uh, the uh, beginning of the case. So this is the mean femoral and this is the mean radial artery pressure. Sometimes they can occur uh, just during bypass, as you can see here. And sometimes they can occur only after bypass. So it's very unpredictable what time they can occur. How can you make such a diagnosis? Well, if you don't have a radial and ephemeral artery pressure, there are some clues, some technique that you can use. The first one, very simple, it's non-invasive blood pressure of your upper extremity. Uh, this is particularly relevant if you have a vascular disease. In patients with vascular disease, about 20% will have a difference more than 20 millimeter uh, gradient between the right and the left arm, and in up to 10% of patients, you can see difference more or equal to 45 millimeter of mercury. Uh, this is a study that's done by Dr. Mathias Jacquet Lacrez, who is uh, uh, one of my uh, co uh, presenter uh, for which we developed this, uh, this study. And he, he looked at, at the intensive care unit uh, patients, not only cardiac patients, but what we found is that when a patient arrived in the ICU who has vasoactive drug, we measured the radial and the femoral gradient, and in those, who, in those 81 uh, patients in which we had both measurements, we observed that it was present in 18.5%. And uh, basically, if you have a difference between your pressure cuff, a mean arterial pressure difference between 11, at more than 11 millimeter of mercury, uh, between the radial and your non-invasive pressure cuff, you had a very high rock curve uh, have, and a specificity of 92 and a sensitivity almost of 100 to detect a significant radial to femoral pressure gradient. So this is one of the a very simple technique to detect those gradients. There's also other technique you can use brain monitoring. In fact, in, uh, in the patient, if you have a very uh, reduced radial artery pressure. This is a patient, a 60 year old before bypass. There's no difference between the radial femoral. The brain saturation is normal. And uh, during bypass, you can see this huge difference between the radial and the femoral artery pressure. So during bypass, if you had a radial, the pressure was 29 millimeter of mercury. Uh, the femoral was much higher, but a clue is that your brain saturation is completely normal. So if you have a very low value in your brain saturation, there's something wrong. 
So uh, the other thing also, this patient, we had transcranial Doppler, and the value was completely normal. So definitively, this was an unreliable radial artery pressure monitoring. Another clue, if you have, you do echo, you look at the mitral valve. If you have mitral regurgitation, the same way that you can estimate your pulmonary artery systolic pressure, you can estimate your systemic arterial pressure if you have mitral regurgitation. So this is a patient, 54-year-old, with infected aortitis. And this patient had a radial of 110 millimeter of mercury. It was a significant amount of vasoactive drugs. The pressure gradient across the mitral valve was 165 millimeter of mercury. When we put ephemeral, we stop all the vasoactive drug. The other elements is the size of the radial, as we discuss. You can also look at the, the, the Doppler signal of your arterial, uh, of your radial artery. So when you look at, when you, in, in, uh, when you do a Doppler of the radial or the uh, brachial or the, uh, the brachial artery, what you will notice is you have a systolic and you have a diastolic reversal. So this patient had a subclavian stenosis and uh, the radial will not be uh, reliable in this case, but if you just in interrogate the Doppler signal of the artery, you'll see no diastolic reversal. So that tells you that this artery is not really, is not, won't be reliable, so you should look at somewhere else. Well, you could say, well, we'll stop us using radial, let's do femoral. The femoral can have the same problem. This is a patient with severe femoral artery stenosis, so the femoral artery won't be reliable. And you can do the same thing. So basically, uh, this is on the 2D Doppler. You can see the obstruction of the femoral artery. You can see this with echo. So what you do, this is a normal Doppler signal. You can see the diastolic reversal. Uh, in this patient with a significant stenosis, there was no diastolic reversal. So basically, the point is, before you put a catheter in an artery, maybe we should examine with 2D and Doppler. Finally, look at the waveform. So normally, when you have a, a normal heart and no heart stenosis, you know, the DPDT should be straight. So if you look at the artery signal on these two examples where you have significant gradient and you see a pulsus tardus, but the heart is completely normal, there's something wrong. And this is another clue that maybe the radial artery pressure is unreliable. What's the implication? Uh, this is a case a report the patients arrive in the emergency room. He's on a, a significant uh, uh, intoxication with a vasodilator drugs. He's on a high dose of noradrenaline. Is, this is the radial artery pressure. And then the clinician, the intensivist, decide to put a radial uh, ephemeral artery pressure, and you can see the huge difference, the huge gradient that you can see, which lasts about seven hours, and also the amount of norepinephrine that just goes down, basically, when you put ephemeral artery pressure, and we see this all the time. And the more your patient is unstable in the ICU, the least is the radial artery reliable in those patients. So what's the impact? So uh, in the study that I discussed before, we compare patients who had a radial versus a radial and ephemeral artery pressure. And typically, patients who have a radial and ephemeral artery pressure at the Heart Institute are patients with longer bypass period, uh, much more complex procedures. However, compared to the, the group who had a radial, they requir required less phenylephrine and the same amount of noradrenaline during the case. Uh, we had a validation group uh, in which we did the same, and again, the same observation. The radial and ephemeral was used in much sicker patients, but basically, they required, again, less phenylephrine and the same amount of noradrenaline, vasopressin, and epinephrine, and they had the same ICU outcome, but in the ICU, the duration of vasoactive drugs was shorter in the group who had the radial and ephemeral than the group who just had the radial artery pressure. A study done by the Korean, where they, uh, the Korean group, where they did 2,000 patients in which they used the radial and ephemeral, they made the same observations. About one-third of patients, cardiac surgery, have significant gradient radial ephemeral, and they use the same definition. What's very interesting in that study, they look at complications of the radial compared to the femoral artery. And in fact, there were less complications with the femoral than with the radial artery pressure. But what they use, they use a very small catheter. So the key is, is to use a small catheter and also to do it under ultrasound guidance. And by doing this, you have much less complications using this uh, approach. So why do we have a gradient? So there's two, uh, two explanations. The first one is there's an obstruction. There's an excess of vasopressor or there's an, an obstruction of the artery. 
But the other mechanism is that you have excessive distal vasodilatation, and that will create the pressure gradient. These gradients can be seen in any critical ill patient. These are patients that have been you know, taken care of over uh, several years. So this is a patient with acute abdomen, with an acute hemothorax, with a thoracic empenema, and patients with gastric varices. So these gradients are not unique to cardiac anesthesia patients. They are present in any hemodynamically unstable patient. So in conclusion, the gradients are present in one third of cardiac surgical, uh, sur surgical patients and probably up to 20% of ICU patients under vasoactive agents. The risk factors, the radial artery diameter, Bypass duration is a universal factor for uh, those uh, patients, but any patients who are hemodynamically stable can have such gradients. Can we detect it? Ultrasound exam of the monitored artery with 2D and Doppler. Non-invasive arterial measurements is the simplest technique that you can do at the bedside. And look at the waveform of your signals. Finally, what's the consequence? Well, if you uh, use a femoral, you might decrease the vasopressor use, and also it could shorten the duration of vasoactive uh, agents in the intensive care unit. We, as a group, we recommend completely in cardiac surgery the use of single radial artery pressure monitoring, and probably we don't recommend it for any patients in shock. Thank you for the invitation. that after cardiopulmonary bypass, this can happen maybe an hour afterwards, it can occur during. How about for non-cardiopulmonary bypass patients? How long do you find this persisting? And if it is days, what should we do about it? Yeah, so what we uh, found in uh, off-pump bypass, it's not as frequent as during cardiopulmonary bypass. Sometimes you, if you have a vascular patient, sometimes you might have it just at the beginning. Uh, the, the prevalence, when we look at when it occurs, it occurs 50%, it occurs during bypass, and about 24, one fourth of the time it's before, and one fourth is after, after bypass. But what's important to realize, especially when you have a dynamic gradient, when it was not there before, it's often triggered by the use of vasoactive drugs. Okay? So if you stop the vasoactive drugs, there's no more gradient. Okay? So the key is really to diagnose it and to get rid of the vasoactive drugs, and then the gradient, as I showed you in the case of, uh, of intoxication, it just goes away. It just goes away. Thank you very much, uh, André, for this uh, very nice presentation. Uh, in fact, the difference between the femoral and the radial may be due to the physiological pulse wave amplification phenomenon that makes the amplitude at the radial side larger than at the femoral side. In the examples you gave, we show that the mean arterial pressure is different between both arteries, which is not compatible with the pulse wave amplification phenomenon. In theory, the mean arterial pressure should be the same. So my question is, in case of stenosis, for instance, or these abnormal differences between radial and femoral artery numbers, did you observe that the mean arterial pressure is indeed different, which would be against the physiological pulse wave amplification phenomenon? Yeah. It's a good question. Uh, the, uh, as you see, when uh, the, the study where they compare patients with vascular disease and cardiac surgical patients, those with vascular disease uh, have, have, have much more frequent stenosis. And, and as you see, as you mentioned, we'll, we'll typically see a big difference in the systolic, sometimes not as much as the mean. However, when these patients are under vasoactive drugs, then you see this difference in the mean, which is a very dynamic difference in the mean arterial pressure. And again, it depends on the degree of obstruction. If you have a 30% obstruction of 50 or 70%, the difference will be completely the same. But what I think is important is to be aware that we're dealing with a much older and older uh, population, and vascular disease is something which we will see more and more often. So I think the ability for us, especially now that we have access to ultrasound in our ICU, is really look at the artery, look at the Doppler signal, because the Doppler signal will tell you if you have a stenosis, because if you have a stenosis on the Doppler, you'll see a pulsus tardis, on your arterial pressure, as you will see in your arterial pressure also. So sometimes your pulsus tardis could be secondary to a bad heart, 
which can happen in any case when you have, a, uh, you know, even in brain trauma, you can have myocardial depression and then you have a post-stardis. You can have an, an aortic stenosis, which you don't know that your patient, old patient has, but also it can be because you have vascular disease also. So these three elements could cause a post-stardis in your radial artery signal. Thank you again, André, for these very practical messages. And it's my pleasure to introduce now uh, Halle Prescott from the University of uh, Michigan Health in the US, and she'll speak about the uh, peripheral IV route for vasopressors administration. Great. Well, thanks so much. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here. And obviously, this is a very uh, exciting topic. I don't know that I've ever had a room so full. So this is excellent. Um, so right, I will be speaking about the peripheral uh, route for vasopressors. Um, I have no financial conflicts. I've listed funding and pertinent roles. I serve on the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. And just wanted to give a huge thanks to Elizabeth Monroe, who's a superstar fellow at University of Michigan and is leading a lot of the research that I will be uh, sharing today. We're very fortunate to have recruited Elizabeth on as faculty, so um, this is, uh, again, big shout out to her work. Um, so when I was in training, um, internal medicine, critical care, the teaching was that vasopressors had to be delivered via central access. And one of the key reasons for this teaching was these case reports that had come out decades ago showing the catastrophic tissue injury and necrosis that can occur from peripheral vasopressor infusion and extravasation and resulting tissue damage. Um, and so it became sort of common practice to deliver vasopressors via central and only central axis. Um, but our, our IV pumps have changed a lot over time. Um, we have more tools at our disposal, things like ultrasound, to ensure that our IV is going uh, where we anticipated or want it to be going. Um, and so this um, sort of old paradigm, I think, over the past five to 10 years has been increasingly questioned. Are there circumstances or situations where we can be delivering vasopressors safely via a peripheral IV? And the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines from 2021 include a new suggestion um, that it is okay to start vasopressors peripherally to restore mean arterial pressure rather than delaying initiation until a central venous axis is obtained. Um, obviously, it takes more time to place and confirm a central line, um, and there is harms from delaying initiation of vasopressors in patients. Um, alongside this suggestion is a remark that when using vasopressors peripherally that they should be administered for only a short period of time um, in a vein proximal to the anticubital fossa, so a large vein. And the rationale for this recommendation, um, there are several. So there is accruing data, sort of case series coming out showing safety of this approach, so a low complication rate uh, when done with a safety protocol in place, um, facilitates faster time to resolution of shock. And then for patients um, who need vasopressor infusions for only a short period of time, um, there's a a number of patients for whom this may mean avoiding central line placement altogether um, and risk for complications that comes with placement of a central line. So this is, I think, the key study um, really informing this uh, updated suggestion. This was a large case series from a single center in New York um, where they implemented a protocol to do peripheral vasopressor infusion, I believe in around 2012. And they followed, um, they collected data for all the patients for the next two years after making um, this new protocol. Um, so in total, they reported on 734 patients who had been treated with peripheral vasopressors under their protocol. Um, and the vast majority of these patients ended up avoiding uh, Oops, uh, having a central line placed altogether. So 87% never went on to have a central line placed. Um, and, and this study is different than a lot of the other studies that have looked at sort of short-term use, for example, in the operating room, because this was a medical ICU population and the median duration was about two days of vasopressor, so prolonged infusion via a peripheral route. Um, they found that uh, only about two to two and a half percent had um, tissue extravasation, and all of those were recognized promptly and treated. Um, and there were no 
no um, instances of tissue injury after these patients had been treated with local fentolamine injection, uh, injection and nitroglycerin paste. It's important to recognize that this study was done with um, careful protocols in place. So this wasn't just, you know, a 24 gauge in the wrist, you know, put the vasopressors on and leave them in the corner, right? I think that's what people worry about when they hear about peripheral vasopressor infusion. Um, but rather, they had a very um, sort of formalized protocol for when this is acceptable um, and what to do if you do identify extravasation. So things that are on their protocol for requirements for the peripheral administration of vasopressors were that it had to be a sufficiently large vein as measured by ultrasound. Um, um, the position of that IV had to be documented as being in the vein by ultrasound before starting this vasopressor infusion. It was done in upper extremities only, um, contralateral to the blood pressure cuff, uh, had to be a, a larger IV, so 18 or 20 gauge, not in the wrist, hand, or antecubital fossa where there would be sort of smaller veins or more risk for displacement, um, and there had to be blood pressure return from the peripheral IV prior to administering vasopressor infusion, and then there was free, frequent nursing checks to make sure that the IV is still working properly, um, and initially they put a limit of up to seven 72 hours, although my understanding is that as they've gained more institutional experience that that's no longer a requirement. On the table on the right, they show the protocol for what to do in the event that there is evidence that the vasopressor is extravasating. Of course, the vasopressor gets stopped immediately. Um, any medication that's left in the IV is pulled back. Um, there's a local injection of fentolamine and then nitroglycerin paste is put on. Um, so, Again, this study reported on the first few years of this protocol with very good outcomes. My understanding is this has continued, and they have had many years of successful use of this protocol. Um, Jose Cardenas, who's the first author on this um, uh, study, uh, is now faculty at University of Michigan. So this is essentially the exact protocol that we use at our hospital um, and have had very similar experiences um, uh, in the sense that we have low rates of peripheral extravasation, I think pretty consistently reported around 2% in other studies studies as well. Um, and then as long as you are doing frequent monitoring, these can be recognized promptly and treated prior to having these catastrophic tissue injuries that we all fear and have been reported in those um, historical case reports that I shared. Um, this is a newer study. Or this is just a poster that was um, presented just last night at um, um, at this conference. This is a um, secondary analysis of the Clovers trial that was just published earlier this month comparing a uh, sort of fluid preferential versus a vasopreferential uh, approach to resuscitation. And, and, and clearly, if you're going to prioritize the initiation of vasopressors over fluid, more people are going to be treated with vasopressors. And so when the trial protocol was being developed for this, um, they made a conscious decision to say, we're going to allow peripheral initiation of vasopressors to make this protocol possible um, and to ensure that we aren't sort of uh, withholding enrollment of patients into this because of concern that it's going to lead to more central lines. So they said up front that if your hospital has a protocol to administer you know, peripheral vasopressors, we're explicitly going to allow that in the trial protocol. Um, so among patients in this trial, 750 of them were treated up with vasopressors, and two-thirds of those patients um, received vasopressors, at least initially, through a peripheral route. Um, the proportion of patients um, having vasopressors administered peripherally did not change over the course of the study year. It's not a huge time period, but um, over the course of the four years where at least some patients were enrolled, no difference. Um, there was a difference uh, based on enrollment location, so higher use of peripheral administration in the ER, which of course makes sense. Maybe those patients were um, getting enrolled slightly earlier in their time course. Um, and then when comparing the liberal versus um, fluid restrictive arms of this trial, there was differences in how many patients got, or the proportion of patients treated with vasopressors, but among patients treated with vasopressors, there was no difference in the route of administration between those two trial arms. Um, on the right-hand part of the slide, it shows the complications, which again were followed prospectively in a clinical trial. Um, so uh, for patients receiving peripheral vasopressors, among 500 patients, there was only three complications noted, um, and these were 
no serious complications, so no grade three, four, five complications. And on the right-hand side, it shows the proportion of complications in patients who had central line placement. And so you can see that there's a much higher or larger number of complications that occurred in patients being treated with a, a central line. So I think this is more confirmatory evidence that, well, this is already happening in practice and um, can be done safely uh, with low rates of complications, again, under appropriate monitoring. So after this um, new suggestion came out in the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, we were curious to see what was happening in the state of Michigan. We have a statewide collaborative um, where we have a registry, collect data about uh, treatment of outcomes of patients with sepsis, uh, and we survey our hospitals every two years to really understand the structures and processes underlying care in Michigan and sort of understand how that is changing over time and how it relates to outcomes. So after that guideline was updated, we surveyed hospitals in Michigan um, and asked about what is happening on the ground. So we found that the vast majority of our hospitals have a policy um, about how vasopressors should be administered in their hospital. Um, and interestingly, it really kind of broke down into three groups. There was 13 hospitals, 25% that said only via central access, sort of no further guidance. That was the only route that was considered acceptable. Um, about a third of these hospitals said, yeah, we want you to give it centrally, but if you're going to give it peripherally, here's what we recommend in terms of monitoring or treatment of extravasation. Um, and then about a third of our hospitals said, you know, we think it's reasonable and, you know, provided a lot more guidance and weren't necessarily trying to push um, clinicians toward the um, central route. So actually a big variation, I think, in terms of what hospitals are recommending uh, clinicians to do. This next slide shows among those hospitals that provide guidance about how to deliver peripheral vasopressors, what are they recommending? And here we found huge variations. So duration limits, dose limits, whether you can do more than one agent via peripheral, uh, whether you can administer any agent. We found vasopressin by far away is the one that is most commonly restricted. So, uh, and that's because there isn't a local antidote like fentolamine for vasopressin, so most restrict that. Um, epinephrine and norepinephrine are also fairly commonly restricted, and then you can see dopamine and phenylephrine um, are the most commonly allowed by peripheral administration. Hospitals also have a range of IV-based limits, so size, monitoring, ultrasound. Um, so it's interesting that I think hospitals are sort of uh, a lot of variation in terms of what is being said. I think it is important that there be some limits in place, um, that there be a monitoring protocol, and that there be a treatment protocol in the event of extravasation. We next look to see, well, those are the policies, what's actually happening in practice at these hospitals. So this is data from 2021 and 2022 um, from about 30 of our hospitals that were submitting data into the registry at that point. So a huge range in terms of the types of hospitals. Um, we've got about 7,000 patients um, from those two years of the registry. These are all patients admitted um, with community onset sepsis. Um, about... Uh, Half of these patients had hypotension within the first six hours. Many of those patients, you know, had it only transiently, were treated with fluids, you know, blood pressure improved. But we had about 600 patients who were initiated on vasopressors early on in their hospitalization. And almost identical to what was seen in the Clover's trial data I just showed you, two-thirds of patients are initiated via the peripheral route. When we drill down to individual hospitals in the registry, this is limited to ones that had at least 25 observations. We see a lot of variation hospital to the hospital. So in blue, it shows the proportion that are initiated via central access, which ranges from about 5%. So some hospitals were virtually all patients um, being in initiated via peripheral, um, all the way up to about two thirds. But every single hospital is doing this for at least some patients, which I think tells you it's important to have some sort of guidance in terms of how to do this, um, given that, again, it is happening in practice. When we look at patient characteristics, there was no difference between the patients initiated peripherally versus centrally, but there were differences in um, other practices. Patients initiated peripherally had shorter time to initiation, um, and interestingly, were more likely to receive dopamine or phenylephrine, which I think reflects some of these policies that limit certain types of vasopressors peripherally. 
We are now working to uh, sort of look at data, trying to understand if there are differences in outcomes. Uh, so stay tuned for more data in this space. Um, in terms of what happens ongoing, we find that about two-thirds of these patients pretty quickly have a central line placed, 40% um, in the next six hours, two-thirds in the next day, and then there's about a third of patients who never go on to have a central line placed, again, suggesting that there are some patients for whom these short durations of peripheral vasopressors may avoid central line, may avoid um, risk for complications associated with that. So bringing it all together, um, we have data, I think accruing data, that peripheral administration is safe. Again, underlined in the setting of safety protocols. This is not something that you can do sort of willy-nilly, um, but again, in these um, large now case series with these protocols in place, low rates of extravasation and essentially no rates of catastrophic tissue injury that we all worry about. Um, this can avoid central line placement in a proportion of patients and those complications. But Avoiding a central line should not be equated to ignoring our patients on vasopressors. These patients are actually monitored very closely, um, and there is a protocol to recognize and address complications that may occur. Um, I will close there, uh, and happy to take questions. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice um, presentation. Um, I have a question. I think that one of the reasons why we insert central venous line, it's not only for the toxicity of norepinephrine, it's also because through one central venous catheter, it's possible to inject several drugs at the same time with different ports. So in fact, in your practice, it means that if you have only peripheral lines, you need lines, I mean different peripheral sites, and it may be difficult to find a way to insert these peripheral lines in some patients. How many of these do you need in a typically critical Ill patient, for instance? Yeah, no, I totally agree. That's a great point. There are many reasons that we place central lines, and this is just one of them. Um, and I think there are many patients that, you know, we still place central lines, and because of this issue of, you know, many different, you know, medications that they're on. Um, and I think... Totally agree with that. I think this is just to say that, that I think historical training and some hospitals say anyone on a vasopressor needs a line, and I don't think we necessarily need to be sort of that dogmatic about it, but really need to look at the sort of whole picture, and it's just one of many factors to place, and certainly multiple medications is going to be a, a common reason, and just the infeasibility of maintaining four peripheral IVs in you know, patients with um, difficult IV access, so absolutely right. Awesome, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next we have Jean-Louis Tabour from Paris South University who will... Okay. Next we have Jean-Louis Tabour from Paris South University who will talk to us about norepinephrine infusion and why it should be started early. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I hope that this is not my countdown because I don't want to start from 12, but for 15 minutes. Uh, I will talk about uh, the interest of uh, starting norepinephrine early in the context of septic shock, essentially. Something uh, working? Okay, thank you. My conflicts of interest are on this slide. So first, why do we use norepinephrine septic shock? Uh, first of all, because septic shock is characterized by the decreased vascular tone due to the presence of many, many, many mediators, inflammation mediators. And this, lead to, this leads to hypotension, which can worsen hypoperfusion in the organs. And this is well illustrated by physiology. This is the autoregulation curve of um, organ blood flow. Organ blood flow on the y-axis, mean arterial pressure on the x-axis, and you know this kind of relationship. And um, there is a physiological plateau, and below this plateau, if uh, blood pressure, MAP, is below a critical level, 
if MAP increases further, uh, it decreases further, you have a decrease in organ blood flow. And this can happen in the kidney, in the brain, in other organs. And we should avoid this because organ hypoperfusion and tissue hypoxia may be related to profound hypotension that may occur in spite of high cardiac output. So this is not always the issue of cardiac output. Second reason is because profound hypotension worsens organ perfusion and represents an independent risk of death. This was uh, demonstrated in many, many studies. I like this study, old study, but interesting study and very, very visual. The area under MAP65 meters of mercury was the best predictor of mortality in these septic shock patients. So it is important to take this into account. And also we know, fortunately, that correction of hypotension with norepinephrine allows improving organ per perfusion. There are many studies showing this. One of them, this one from Marseille, the group of uh, Claude Martin, they look at urine output and creatine clearance in patients with septic shock who receive uh, norepinephrine. MAP at baseline was 54, so a low value. And when they increased uh, MAP with norepinephrine, the values went up, the values of MAP went up, of course, but also the values of ruin output and creatine clearance, while cardiac output did not change. So it was not due to cardiac output, but probably due to the increase in MAP. Probably when you increase MAP in these patients from 40, 54 to 72, you improve renal blood flow, even if you don't increase cardiac output. This is very interesting uh, to keep this in mind. Some years ago with the SICM, we, we performed a survey. We had intensivists who responded to the survey. We also had experts in terms of vasopressors from the ESICM who also answered the survey. And it is very interesting to see that. The intensivists who responded, we had 80, 839 respondents for, from eight. 82 countries, it's not negligible. Only 12% of them said, I use a vasopressor early before completion, complete vol volume resuscitation, and this even in spite of deep dependency. Only 12% said this. It was, the paper was published in 2019. It was, the survey was performed one year uh, before. So in 2018, the majority of intensivists uh, were reluctant to start norepinephrine early and they wanted to first give fluid and to wait for completion of fluid resuscitation. But at that time, exactly the same time, we asked experts, people who published papers on vasopressors, on hemodynamics, etc., and 34 experts from 11 countries, and they said exactly the opposite. Vasopressor should be started early before completion of fluid resuscitation, and we found a reasonable consensus. 70, 80 percent experts agreed on this statement. It is very interesting. So, what are now the arguments to start norepinephrine early? First, I said the duration and severity of hypotension is associated with increased mortality. So, when the hypotension is very severe, we should start very, very urgently. No epinephrine. Also, because no epinephrine is not only a vasoconstrictor, no epinephrine can increase cardiac output when started early. It can increase preload when started early. And this is what we found in two studies. This is one of these two, these two studies with Olfa Mzawi and others in my unit in Bicetra Hospital. We gave no epinephrine to 105 patients with septic shock, MAP was 54 as at baseline, increased with norepinephrine to 76. Stroke volume index, stroke volume increased with norepinephrine. The global diagnostic volume index, which is a marker of preload, increased with norepinephrine. And pulse pressure variation, which is an index of preload responsiveness, decreased with norepinephrine. So now epinephrine was able to increase cardiac preload, cardiac output, and to decrease preload dependency. 
We did another study with Xavier Monet, more or less with the same uh, parameters, but we used echocardiography in addition, and we found exactly the same results. And the message of these two studies were that norepinephrine is able to increase cardiac preload, cardiac output in preload-dependent patients, and to reduce the degree of preload dependency. This is exactly as fluid infusion does, exactly the same effect. What does, what could, what could be the mechanism? Probably by blood redistribution from unstressed to stressed volume. And we address this question in another study with Romain Persikini, Xavier Monet, and others. Uh, we try to estimate the mean systemic pressure of course, today I will not go into details, but we try to estimate the mean systemic pressure at two doses of norepinephrine, one very small and one higher. We observe an increase in cardiac index with a higher dose. We also uh, observe an increase in the mean systemic pressure, confirming that probably we have a blood redistribution from unstressed to stressed volume. And this is fine uh, because in sepsis, unstressed volume is already, already increased, abnormally increased, and if you give fluid without norepinephrine, you can overfill this unstressed blood volume. What is interesting is to use a combination of fluid and norepinephrine, because you have a potential, potential advantages of this combination. First, you increase more the mean pressure than fluid alone resulting in, on a better cardiac output. This is an, another study uh, we did with um, Iman Adag, Xavier Monet, and others more recently, and we performed passive leg raising, not at a test, as a test of fluid responsiveness, but just to mimic fluid challenge. We did not want to give fluid challenge, to, to give fluid. So we use PLR as a, as a fluid challenge, preload challenge, without norepinephrine and with norepinephrine. And we estimated the mean systemic pressure, PMS. And in almost all patients, PMS increased more, more when norepinephrine was added. So we have a better effect of the combination. And of course, in addition, if you use both, you can correct hypotension better than fluid alone. Don't forget that fluid alone does not correct hypotension a lot in septic shock patients. This is an interesting study coming from the, uh, Manuel uh, Ignacio Mange Garcia and the group of Mauricio Cecconi. They look at patients with septic shock and they subdivide these patients into groups, preload responders, preload non-responders. And they look at the data before volume expansion and after volume expansion. As you can see on this slide, fluid infusion decreased systemic vascular resistance when cardiac output increased. So if you give fluid alone, even in the patient who responds to fluid administration, you have no effect on uh, blood pressure. The combination of fluid and blood pressure can be more effective to increase blood pressure. An additional effect is that norepinephrine is able to increase cardiac contractility when started early. This is a study we did with Alpha Mzawi, and we used echocardiography to measure left ventricular ejection fraction, velocity, time integral, and many other indices of the systolic function of the left and of the right ventricle. And what we observed before and after norepinephrine, we observed in all patients an increase in LVF an increase in VTI and an increase in all the other indices of systolic function of the heart. While, in fact, systolic arterial pressure was 85 at the beginning, before 85, went up to 124, and in spite of this increase in systolic arterial pressure, which is a good marker of afterload of the left ventricle, in spite of the increase in afterload, we observe an increase in LVF, meaning that probably norepinephrine was able to increase cardiac contractility in these patients with septic shock at the early phase. And we observe this mechanism, this effect, also in the subset of patients with low LVF at baseline, less than 
even these patients increased LVF when norepinephrine was given. The potential mechanisms for this is that norepinephrine can have an effect on beta-1 receptors which are not yet regulated at the early phase and maybe an increase in the coronary perfusion pressure because norepinephrine can increase diacetyl pressure which is the upstream pressure for uh, the coronary vessels of the left ventricle. So these effects can be beneficial at the early phase of also. The third argument is that early initiation of norepinephrine prevents harmful fluid overload. If you give early, you use less volume. And we know that volume is not always good. Fluid overload is not always good for the patient. We have many studies showing this. This is an interesting study by Gustavo Spinatasco and others coming from uh, uh, Latin America. It was, in fact, a comparison of two groups of patients using a propensity score. So patients were matched using some parameters. And in this study, we looked at very early administration of norepinephrine versus delayed administration. This is very clear on this slide. You use less resuscitation fluids when you give norepinephrine earlier. Very clear on this, on this slide. And the fourth argument is probably, and recent studies show that an improved outcome with, high, with early norepinephrine. I take again this study because mortality was already addressed in this study. As you can observe, patients who receive norepinephrine very early compared to delayed administration at a better survival rate than the others. So again, this is not a prospective randomized controlled trial. It is a propensity match uh, study, but the results give you a, a signal in favor of early administration. There is a single center randomized controlled trial coming from Thailand where they randomized two of patients with septic shock. One group received norepinephrine early, one group later. And the primary outcome was shock control rate by six hours after diagnosis. Shock control was defined as MAP higher than 65 with urine flow higher than 0.5 ml per gram per hour for two consecutive hours or decrease serum lactate by more than 10% from baseline. And they found that in the early norepinephrine group, more patients achieved this shock control rate, 76 versus 48 in the other group. So better shock control rate with early norepinephrine administration. In addition, they found less complications in the early group. For example, less uh, cardiogenic pyramid edema and lower incidence of cardiogenic pyramid edema and lower incidence of new onset of cardiac arrhythmia in the early norepinephrine group. And this is a meta-analysis uh, looking at studies who comp which compare the early and delayed administration again in favor of early administration. And this is a more recent study looking at the pre-hospital administration of norepinephrine. Pre-hospital administration. And patients who receive norepinephrine at the pre-hospital uh, uh, location uh, had a better survival than the other one. And now we know, and it was, it was uh, clearly uh, said by uh, the previous speaker, we know that uh, the peripheral line is not so dangerous when you give norepinephrine peripherally. And this is a, a big study with many, many patients included, and they had a low, very, very low incidence of extravasation. And even when extravasation was present, no local complications needing surgery or medical treatment were uh, observed. And this is why now the su surviving sepsis campaign guidelines recommend to use uh, the peripheral line to start, to start a treatment by norepinephrine. And this should be uh, done in, a, in a, the first four hours, for example. 
So, these are my arguments to start norepinephrine early. And I would say that in case of any dupe, a useful way to identify the appropriate time to start norepinephrine is to consider the diacetyl pressure. If the diacetyl pressure is low, maybe it could be a good indication to start norepinephrine. I would like to thank you very much. Jean-Louis, you have made a compelling argument for early norepinephrine use. We do this all the time in the operating room when I operate on people with necrotizing soft tissue infections. It is part of our routine practice. Why do you think it is so hard to get the intensivists that you surveyed to adopt that very practice? The history will go to this uh, early administration. I have a lot of experience about intensive care. Uh, at the beginning, or at the beginning for me, years and years ago, we did not use norepinephrine. We are scared by the use of norepinephrine. We prefer to give no dopamine. And after, we had uh, studies comparing dopamine and norepinephrine. And finally, we gave norepinephrine earlier. And still, now we have studies showing that it is better to start very, very early because septic shock is not hypovolemic shock only. If you have septic shock, by definition, you have a low vascular tone. If you have a low vascular tone, there is no reason to, to delay uh, norepinephrine administration. But it was interesting to look at the survey we did, where the majority of people <laughs> gave later, but, and the experts, uh, knowing the literature probably, uh, said earlier. But now if we redo, if we redo this survey, maybe we will obtain different results. Thank you very much, Jean-Louis. Thank you again for this uh, nice presentation. We move to the next one, and it's my great pleasure to <laughs> introduce Daniel de Becker, who you know from the Free University of Brussels, Chirac Hospitals, how to promote the uh, vein of construction with norepinephrine, Daniel. So good morning. Uh, I hope also to have a better count than this one, because in 10 minutes it will be very difficult. So uh, how to promote, I mean, this is basically something we knew from the medical school that venous constriction is occurring as a response to cold. I mean, it's not in this room, but maybe when you go out, you can indeed have a difference between your veins. And also as a response to exercise. Just why do you cut kind of put increases during exercise? As a response to bleeding, and also why our patients often support bleeding up to a certain point. But what are exactly the consequences of venous constriction? Because we can say, okay, we will vasoconstrict the veins and we will be happy. Yes, for some aspects, maybe not for all. And yes, 55, 1955, Guyton already mentions this very important aspect of the venous return, so indeed what occurs in the vein is affecting our cardiac output. Because indeed, the venous return is determined, okay, by the gradient between mean system pressure and right arterial pressure, but of course, also the intercept with the cardiac function, and then we have the cardiac output, the actual one. And if we give some volume, then indeed we have an increase in the cardiac output in, of course, a fluid responder. So, what would be the impact on venous constriction? Well, we need to think at there are different veins, and just the reservoir is probably much more in some veins like these planklet veins, and perhaps also the cutaneous veins where the magnitude of the reservoir is greater than in the deep limb veins. That's why, perhaps, when John Lee mentions the fact that the passive leg raising test was increasing in presence of norepinephrine, is because indeed the deep venous veins were not affected. Otherwise, there will be no blood mobilized from the periphery because already everything would have been squeezed into the central system. So all these systems do not behave the same. And as you can see, these are sensitive to circulating catecholamines. Then, we need to think at the reservoir itself. 
And this is, of course, an old concept of the stress and unstressed volume. And so indeed, when we have some dilation, which occurs during sepsis, anesthesia, and here's a drug that was vasodilatory agent, we will indeed have an increase in the reservoir. And of course, if we want to restore cardiac output, we have to give some volume in this condition. However, if you give some vasopressors or some venous constriction to resize the tank, then you spare some volume here that you don't have to give to your patients. And that's indeed this principle tested in experimental conditions where indeed the early introduction of norepinephrine allows limitation of the amount of fluid that you have to give for reaching exactly the same cardiac output in these animals and perhaps some uh, uh, other beneficial effects but more difficult uh, to really state in these conditions. And of course, the study already mentions that you have to give less volume when you institute vasopressors early on. And indeed, there is an increase in the end diastolic volume, so an increase in preload, um, affected here also by ECO, which is also demonstrating this impact on preload, an increase in cardiac index in these patients with, in that trial, a minimal change in the cardiac function. So mostly a preload dependent effect in that trial at least. But yeah, there is some drawback. Vasopressors may increase preload, but also increase venous resistances. And indeed, we have this impact here on this uh, other slope here. Uh, norepinephrine can auto-transfuse some blood. We are very happy, but Norepinephrine can also increase the venous resistance if it also constricts the veins more proximally. And then we will have this effect, and this may unfortunately decrease cardiac output. So do we observe this? Well, it seems to be occurring, these data from uh, one of our chairmen here, that indeed this slope is also indeed uh, affected by the presence of norepinephrine, but nevertheless, the net result was an increase in cardiac because the mobilization of fluid was much more important than the increase in venous resistance. So what are the advantages of venous constriction? Obviously, redistribute volume from unstressed to stressed volume, which decreases the need for first of low volume administration. So it may decrease, of course, in some conditions, the need for volume recitation, and in fluid responders, of course, it may increase the cardiac output. The disadvantages should not be neglected. The increase in venous resistance and the increase in the pressure in the collecting venules. So these are the exits of the microcirculation and decreasing potentially the pressure gradients across capillaries. And this may perhaps lead to, to tissue edema at some point and also a decrease in capillary perfusion. And indeed, these concept of the pressure gradient across capillaries here in green controls is of course decreased when you have vasoconstriction, especially on the venous side, but also on the arterial side. And of course, vasodilation will lead to the contrary. So perhaps if at some point we can have the venous constriction here with a beneficial effect on cardiac output without too much vasoconstricting at the entrance of the capillary, this perhaps may be more beneficial. But can we reach this goal? We will discuss this later on. Which vasopressors act on the venous system? Well, obviously the adrenergic agents through the alpha receptors seems to um, act on this. And obviously these act at different levels more on collecting veins and on second order than on first order and on a more close to central veins. So all veins do not behave the same. And so it's indeed retrieving flow from the periphery to the more central compartment and trying not to affect so much the central compartment in these conditions. And it seems to be related both to the alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors that are present on the venous system. So indeed, we have in some drugs that will affect both alpha-1 and alpha-2, like norepinephrine, but maybe some drugs may be more sensitive to the alpha-2. And it's interesting to realize that the alpha-2 density is a little bit higher in veins than in arteries. 
And again, the response to different stimuli is not exactly the same. Hypoxia inhibits alpha-2, but not alpha-1 in first order veins, while the, there is minimal impact of hypoxia to inhibit the vasoconstriction in second order veins. So again, a different behavior in different stress conditions of these different uh, veins there. Angiotensin also induces venous contraction. And you can see it's mostly angiotensin 2, uh, more than angiotensin 1. And you can see that this effect is uh, partially inhibited by captopril in these conditions. And also, uh, interestingly, um, the angiotensin does not potentiate the impact of norepinephrine on the venous system, at least. For vasopressin, it's a little bit different. Vasopressin uh, also uh, affects the venous system here. Um, it is basically true a V1 effect because indeed desmopressin has no impact on the veins while the um, um, uh, V1 with a V1, vasopressin plus a v, uh, vasopressin 1 antagonist, uh, there is no or minimal effect there. And so indeed it is a V1 receptor which is more affected there for the venous constriction. And interestingly, vasopressin potentiates the effects of norepinephrine on venous contraction. So the different vasopressors act on the venous system, but the interaction between the different vasopressors is different according to the combination. Vasopressin and norepinephrine more effective than uh, norepinephrine plus angiotensin. And also some other agents we do not have really in the clinic, like endothelin, also induces venous contraction. So another very important aspect is to realize that the density of the receptors is again different according to the site. So in a more distal place, you have more uh, receptors than you have in a more central one. And that's perhaps also why when Dr. Prescott discussed the location of your catheter, it's probably wiser to have it in a more central one because if a more distal, you will constrict the vein. So even though an ultrasound were very nice to say we have a large vein, yes, but you put norepinephrine inside, you squeeze the veins. And then you end up with a very small one and the risk of effusion will be larger. So of course, in a more central, this risk will be minimized. So, which agent for venous constriction? Well, both, all these three can be used. However, remember one very important aspect. In most cases, the action of the arterial system will be much more predominant than the action on the venous system. So in some patients where you already have the blood pressure you wish, well, trying to promote first a venous constriction to try to limit fluid, fluid administration, undue fluid demonstration well, will be more limited. So perhaps we should look at some agents with a more central one. And for this, um, we need to think at the relationship between the type of receptor you have. And it seems that the alpha-2 receptors are much more predominant on the venous system than the alpha-1. Here, by inhibiting the, specifically inhibiting the alpha-1 by uh, prasosin, you can see that you inhibit everything that occurs in the artery, but not really in the venous system. So having an alpha-2 may be somewhat interesting. And here also you can see the receptor density of the alpha-2 are mostly on the venous system, while the density of the alpha-1 is much more present on the uh, arterial one. So having a more specific alpha-2 may be uh, interesting there. Do we have these? Well, there is it. I mean, at least in the literature, we can find it. Um, and, and, and so this is one of the new agents, a promising agent for that aspect. And indeed, it seems that in rats, it can indeed lead to some improvement here. Um, mostly, okay, a little bit under the pressure, but mostly on the cardiac output in these conditions. And of course, as a consequence, limit the increase in lactate levels. 
And the same is true here in another model of, uh, of hemorrhagic shock. You can see that indeed the amount of fluid was quite limited, minimal impact on blood pressure, but an increase in cardiac output by this impact on venous return. So it seems quite promising in these conditions. Uh, do we have data um, more than just this sparing? Well, Maybe in outcome, but in, a small, in an animal's uh, trials, uh, we have a lot of things that improve outcomes. So we need perhaps to look at human data. We do not have a lot of data. We have some data coming from India, two studies um, here, uh, where this was used in hypovolemic shock. And many of these patients were also with diarrhea, and this is the source of hypovolemic shock in these conditions. And so what they have is uh, some decrease in use of vasopressors and the uh, shock index that was indeed lower in that group compared to the other group. Uh, and more patients reaching the, the blood pressure more rapidly also. And in the other trial here, um, you can see no major difference here, or you don't see it, no major difference in the group at baseline, but uh, what the effect was, well, minimal effect, effect on the uh, amount of blood, perhaps a trend for the vasopressors, uh, but uh, a higher, um, a slightly higher blood pressure in these patients, and more patients reaching the goal, and the lower blood lactate levels in the group receiving the alpha-2 agonist compared to the other one. Um, no major other impact on mortality, but you can see mortality was very low in these trials, of course. Uh, so, uh, at the end, uh, which type of shock would benefit most from uh, venous constriction? Obviously, hypovolemic and distributive shock, whereas the uh, uh, impact on the venous compartment may be interesting there. Uh, Cardiac shock, uh, maybe not, because you will increase preload of the right ventricle, and this and the left ventricle, this may not be the best thing to do. So in conclusion, venous constriction is an important component of the hemodynamic effects of our vasopressors, and we often neglect it in the past. For usual vasopressors, the arterial constrictive component is largely outweighing the venous constrictive effects. And the predominant alpha-2 agonists appear to be attractive um, because it predominantly tar targets a venous constrictive effect, at least in hypovolemic and potentially in distributive shock, but definitely we need more data for this aspect. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this very precise and detailed presentation. You mentions that the uh, constrictive effect on the veins may be more important than the volume effect, that uh, the increase in resistance may be um, predominant compared to the increase in mean systemic pressure. Don't you think that it may be, um, especially the case in hypovolemic shock, where vasoconstriction at baseline is already very strong, compared to septic shock where the initial vasodilation makes the immune systemic pressure larger? Well, I, I, I think that uh, it, it's present probably in both cases where indeed just by resizing the tank is, uh, with, with, is affecting the, the volume you may have by this. And of course, at some point, it will increase also the pressure um, when the tank is filled. So when the tank is not filled, you have less effect on the pressure, of course, than you have when you have the tank which is already filled and when you squeeze a little bit the tank. So um, it's difficult in distributive shock to dis discriminate the impact between the v volumic effect induced by the change in the tank and the increase, of course, in pressure, because as you have already some volume, you will also increase, of course, the pressure when you do this, which is less the case in high problemic shock. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you very much, Daniel. Now that you've heard a lot about venoconstriction, we're going to hear from Diamanto Aretha from Patras University in Greece about why you should start, perhaps, with vasopressin. Uh, good morning to everybody. I have no conflict of interest. Uh, so, uh, vasopressin uh, is uh, synthesized in the hypothalamus, and from there, circulates to the posterior pituitary gland and uh, then to the blood. 
and acts through three different subtypes of, uh, of receptors. The um, V1A receptors, vasopressin, cause platelet uh, aggregation, uh, cause vasoconstriction and increase in blood pressure, and also cause uh, uh, vasoconstriction of renal efferent arterioles and increase in the uresis. The uh, V2 receptors, uh, vasopressin causes release of uh, coagulation factors and water reabsorption from the kidneys. And via V1B receptors, uh, the drug causes increase in insulin and cortisone levels in the blood. So in 2019, came out an individual patient data meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. And in that meta-analysis, uh, the authors uh, concluded that vasopressin was, uh, had similar mortality uh, compared to norepinephrine, but a different side effect profile, while there was no evidence for differences between uh, uh, subgroup effects. In that meta-analysis, the authors included the most important randomized controlled trials, um, the VAST uh, trial, the VANISH, the VANX2 trial, and an older small trial with uh, a high risk of bias. And the, they concluded there was no uh, mortality uh, difference. And we can see 20 day, 28 day mortality was similar between the groups. Serious adverse events were similar, but vasopressin reduced requirement for renal replacement therapy. Also, vasopressin uh, caused more digital ischemia, but uh, that effect was mainly due to the, to the VANISH trial where higher doses of vasopressin were used. Vasopressin caused fewer arrhythmias, similar mesenteric ischemia, and acute coronary syndromes. So, in the past, uh, many strategies have aimed to treat sepsis by targeting pro-inflammatory mediators, and all these strategies have failed to improve outcome in, in, uh, in patients. So, recently, attentions have shifted from the inhibition of the pro-inflammatory response to the detrimental role of the anti-inflammatory phase of sepsis, which is called sepsis-induced immunoparalysis. So immunoparalysis render patients unable to clear their primary infections and uh, increase their secondary opportunistic infections. So norepinephrine, which is the, stoner, the cornerstone treatment for septic shock, uh, could have a detrimental role in sepsis-induced immunoparalysis. Norepinephrine stimulates both alpha and beta adrenoreceptors, and uh, through alpha adrenoreceptors, uh, norepinephrine, norepinephrine increase protein kinase C, increase the levels of NFKB, and NFKB increase the pro-inflammatory cytokine gene transcription, so there is an increase in TNFA, interleukin-6, and interleukin-1b. Uh, via beta adrenoreceptors, norepinephrine increase CAMP, protein kinase C, and, NFK, and reduce NFKB, so there is a reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokine gene transcription, and, uh, and in a, re a reduction in the pro-inflammatory cytokines, while uh, interleukin-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, is reduced, is uh, increased. Uh, all these in anti-inflammatory effects of uh, norepinephrine are diminished by beta blockers. A very important study came out in 2020. In that study, uh, the authors investigated uh, uh, the effects of norepinephrine and vasopressin on the immune response and host defense. And uh, 30 healthy volunteers, leukocytes from six to nine donors, 129 septic shock patients and my septic shock models uh, were used. And the authors concluded that norepinephrine dysregulates the immune response and compromises host defense during sepsis, while vasopressin had no such immunologic effects. When human leukocytes stimulated with uh, uh, lipoprotein saccharide, norepinephrine dose dependently attenuated the production of the pro-inflammatory mediators like TNFA, IP10, or uh, interleukin-1b, uh, while increased interleukin-10. Uh, on, and on the other hand, vasopressin did, do, did not influence uh, cytokine production at all. And uh, in uh, mice model, norepinephrine uh, modulates those dependently cytokine responses. And uh, as we can see, there was a reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokines and an increase in interleukin-10. And when vasopressin was used in mice models, 
uh, it, the drug exerted no immunomodulatory effects at all. You can see the uh, green bars. There, there are no statistically significant difference when uh, um, vasopressin is uh, compared to uh, buffered saline. Also, norepinephrine infusion uh, increases bacterial dissemination in experimental sepsis, and we can see that there is an increase in colony forming units in blood, liver, and spleen. And uh, in uh, experimental sepsis uh, in humans, low dose of norepinephrine enhanced interleukin 10 and uh, reduced uh, IP10, which was uh, a uh, pro inflammatory cytokine. In septic shock patients, in 129 septic shock patients, uh, norepinephrine treatment uh, reduced the TNFA to interleukin 10 ratio, and that ratio is reflecting the pro inflammatory to the anti inflammatory balance, and that ratio was significantly higher in patients that were treated with uh, Vita blockers. So, Vita blockers perhaps uh, attenuate norepinephrine's anti inflammatory effects primary via vita, vita zero adrenal receptors in sepsis. In a recently published study uh, that was a retrospective observational study uh, in septic shock patients with lactate levels more than two, uh, the investigators evaluated the association of catecholamine dose, lactate, and shock duration at vasopressin initiation and mortality uh, in patients with uh, septic shock and uh, concluded that there was an increase to 20.7% in hospital mortality for every 10 micrograms per minute increase in norepinephrine dose up to 60 micrograms per minute at time of vasopressin initiation, and also uh, increased lactate concentration at time of vasopressin initiation uh, was associated with uh, an increase in hospital mortality. And we can see the results of the trial here again. Uh, at uh, uh, vasopressin initiation, uh, higher norepinephrine doses up to 60 micrograms per minute and higher lactate uh, concentrations were each, were each uh, associated with increased in hospital mortality. In another study, uh, that was a multicenter retrospective study of 385 patients with a mean Apache 2 score of 31 and a mean baseline SOFA score of 13. Uh, the authors uh, concluded that for every hour delay in vasopressin initiation, the odds of the composite outcome, SOFA score more than three from baseline to 72 hours, or in hospital all cause mortality increased by 2%. And in another similar study, uh, in a, a retrospective study with 243 patients, uh, the authors concluded that early addition of vasopressin in less than three hours to norepinephrine was associated with a faster time to, to shock resolution and a decrease in ICU length of stay. And in that study, when, uh, when vasopressin uh, initiated, uh, norepinephrine dose was similar at both at the early and the late uh, vasopressin initiation group. And uh, in 2017, came out the VANCS randomized control trial. Uh, in that uh, study, uh, the authors compared vasopressin uh, to norepinephrine in patients with vasoplegic shock after cardiac surgery. Uh, that was a single-center, double-blind uh, trial uh, with 330 patients with vasoplegic shock uh, who were randomized to receive uh, either vasopressin or norepinephrine. In patients receiving vasopressin, the primary endpoint, mortality, that was again composite uh, primary uh, endpoint, mortality or severe complications, occurred in 32% uh, compared with 49% uh, in patients receiving norepinephrine. Also, atrial fibrillation was less frequently, fr frequent in the vasopressin group. And we can see uh, the uh, effect-free survival kaplan major curve where uh, vasopressin uh, is uh, more effective than uh, norepinephrine. In that trial, uh, patients that treated with vasopressin had lower primary outcome. The primary outcome was uh, a composite, uh, 30 day, included 30 days mortality, mechanical ventilation, uh, reoperation, sternal wood infection, and, and stroke. 
but uh, the, the reduction in the primary outcome mainly um, was associated with the reduction in uh, the rate of acute renal failure in patients treated with uh, vasopressin. Also, uh, patients treated with vasopressin uh, revealed lower uh, rates of atrial fibrillation, uh, lower length of hospital stay, and lower length of uh, ICU stay in that trial. And uh, after the shock resolution, uh, which uh, vasopressor should we discontinue first? Um, in a retrospective study with uh, more than 2,000 patients, uh, of whom almost half discontinued vasopressin first and the others discontinued norepinephrine first, patients that discontinued uh, vasopressin first uh, revealed higher incidence of hypotension uh, more days uh, for reversal of shock, higher mortality, uh, hospital mortality, and 28-day mortality, and uh, higher odds ratio for renal replacement uh, therapy. And uh, we can see the incidence of hypotension following uh, the vasopressor discontinuation, that, uh, and we can see in the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve that the patients uh, that uh, um, discontinued vasopressin first had uh, uh, revealed higher, level, higher rates of uh, uh, hypotension. So, <clears throat> starting with vasopressin, uh, do we really have uh, the data? Uh, I, I think not yet. Uh, there were no mortality differences between norepinephrine and vasopressin in previous face-to-face -face randomized control trials, although some of these trials were not really face-to-face, -face, uh, as both groups, the intervention and the control group, uh, um, receiving uh, norepinephrine. Uh, norepinephrine significantly dysregulates the host response and contributes to the development and propagation of sepsis-induced immunoparalysis. Uh, on the other hand, vasopressin has no immunomodulating side effects, uh, cause fewer arrhythmias, but perhaps, perhaps more digital, digital ischemia events. Uh, higher norepinephrine dose and higher lactate at uh, uh, vasopressin initiation were each associated with higher in hospital mortality in patients with septic shock. Vasopressin should be started early within three to seven hours or when norepinephrine dose in less, is less than 15 to 20 micrograms per minute and lactate level is more than two. And of course, more randomized controlled trials are needed for reappraisal of our, car of our current clinical management in patients with sepsis. And uh, thank you very much. Nicely done. I have a, a question for you. If we don't have the data that supports starting vasopressin as the first drug, should we always think about or always order vasopressin whenever we order norepinephrine? Should they come as a paired bundle? Um. Yeah, yes, perhaps. I think, uh, in fact, uh, I don't know if uh, we ever will have the data. Uh, uh, sepsis is uh, very complex and uh, with many different uh, phenotypes. So I don't think one uh, treatment uh, will, uh, uh, will uh, improve uh, the outcome. I think that we need a combination of treatments. And for now, uh, the data support uh, uh, to use both these two drugs, vasopressin and norepinephrine. Although I believe that in some sub subpopulations, like uh, in the Vang Suan trial, uh, vasoplegic shock, uh, in these patients perhaps vasopressin is better. But uh, in fact, we need a combination of the two drugs for now. So, <clears throat> regarding this comment, Diamond, uh, what about your last message? Do you think we will have some next RCTs with a uh, vasopressin in septic shock? Uh, or, uh, if uh, you had to build one, which one would it be? Um, if you had to build a new trial with yes. norepinephrine, uh, which one fact, would it be? Yes. Uh, I, would, uh, I would build a face-to-face -face trial. In fact, I, I think uh, we know that uh, now that vasopressin is not uh, uh, dangerous, it's, uh, it's a, a safe drug, so I, I would build a face-to-face -face trial, a randomized control prospective trial with uh, half patients receiving uh, vasopressin and half of them receiving uh, norepinephrine. 
uh, no, perhaps with a third group, with uh, both groups, but starting uh, vas vasopressin in, in low doses of uh, uh, norepinephrine, perhaps with a, a third group. But uh, I think we, we need face-to-face uh, -face trials. Looking for equivalence of the treatments or for superiority of the treatments? Uh, you would expect that uh, both groups would have equal outcome? Um, I think, uh, yes, I think that uh, the, the outcome will be similar, uh, finally. Uh, I, I, again, I don't know what will happen in some subpopulations, sub but uh, I think, especially when starting uh, uh, vasopressin early and in low doses of norepinephrine and early in the first three hours, uh, the results will be similar, I think. Except if uh, we, we introduce in the study a, a large, a very large number of patients in, the, in, in this case, uh, perhaps we'll find some differences. Thank you very much. Thank you again. And uh, it's indeed time to move to the next talk. New Pfizer Press's new evidence by Ashish Kana from the Wake Forest Medical School Winston Salem in the U.S. Thank you. And i um, excited to be uh, back in Brussels for another year. And, and yes, uh, we're going to talk about new evidence uh, with some new uh, vasopressors. If my slide advances. Hopefully it will. Oh, there we go. Sorry. So, um, greetings from uh, North Carolina. I did want to show you the previous slide. There we go. Um, <laughs> so, greetings from North Carolina and, uh, and from the Wake Forest School of Medicine. Uh, these are some of my affiliations and disclosures that are relevant. So, um, yes, so we, we haven't talked about angiotensin II, and I'm going to start with angiotensin II, and uh, Professor Belomo, as you can see, will follow with newer evidence around angiotensin II. So, sort of the third leg of this a uh, three-legged stool to maintain blood pressure, so sympathetic nervous system, arginine vasopressin, and then the um, angiotensin II. Um, you all are mostly familiar with this. This is not new news. Uh, in 2017, I had the honor of leading this uh, 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 extremely accomplished group across 84 ICUs all over the world. We randomized about 330-odd patients with high output shock to angiotensin II versus placebo. This was our primary outcome, so a primary outcome of blood pressure response to a MAP of 75 or 10 more than baseline in about 70% of our patient population. Um, again, this here really shows that how brisk that blood pressure response was with angiotensin II. It went up pretty briskly in the first three hours. That's where we were up titrating the angiotensin, and then all the way out to 48 hours or so, we saw a mostly a decent separation be between the two groups. Again, um, you all are familiar with this trial, so I'm not going into great, great depths here. Uh, no difference in survival. The trial was not powered for mortality. And, and again, I say this wherever I go, head-to-head uh, -head vasopressor trials really haven't shown an outcomes difference in terms of mortality. So we're still, um, you know, there, that's open for debate whether we should be looking at mortality or, or not at vasopressor trial outcomes. So let me talk about the more interesting part now, so which is why we should or should not use angiotensin. So up top you see, you know, stuff you read in medical school, angiotensinogen to aldosterone as the ultimate downstream product with renin and ACE being the mediating enzymes. Um, the interesting part, as I said, is what happens in severe shock and, and endothelial injury is ACE is either dysfunctional, downregulated, or unable to act on downstream receptors, and the back products, that's renin and ang and angiotensin, neogen, go up. And, and when all of them go up, this milieu of a change in this, um, uh, this, this balance does affect overall outcomes. I'm going to talk about that in, in the slides to come. The other thing you all should know is the classical pathway. I just talked about the classical pathway, but there is a non-canonical pathway. So when ACE is dysfunctional, the pathway is going to get diverted to ACE2 and produce angiotensin 2 to 9 
and 1 to 7, and there are several other metabolites, so the pathway itself is way more complicated than the slide suggests. But these metabolites are vasodilatory in nature, and it may well be that the hypotension and resistant hypotension we see in catecholamine resistant shock is because of these alternative angiotensin metabolites. So all of that, sorry, all of that kept in consideration. Let's talk about uh, what we've seen so far. So this was post hoc analysis from the ATHOS-3 trial where uh, with Professor Belomo, we, we did this work. We looked at a population median renin value. And in the red, in the, in the, in the bright red line, is the patients who had a higher than population median renin value at baseline. About half of them were dead at a week out. About 80% did not survive at about four weeks out. These patients got placebo compared to the dark or bright blue line that received angiotensin II in the presence of a high renin. And as is uh, obvious on the slide here, there's a survival benefit. If you look at it another way, the group with placebo that's in the red here, placebo meaning continuation of receiving of norepinephrine or vasopressin or epinephrine, whatever they were on, nothing happens to the renin from baseline to hour three versus you give synthetic angiotensin to the renin goes, goes down. If I go back to that last slide, give, angi uh, give angiotensin to the renin goes down. So, um, that, that sets us up nicely, and then uh, here in Belgium, uh, th this was this really nice work done in about 110 um, heterogeneous shock uh, population uh, kind of patients in, in an ICU here. They, the investigators determined that renin was a better predictor of perfusion and a better predictor, so a change in renin was a better predictor of ICU mortality compared to a change in lactate. And indeed, it wasn't affected by renal replacement therapy or, or drugs or, or diurnal variation. So interesting data here. I wrote an editorial. I said, is, is renin the new lactate? And, and possibly it is, but we do need a bedside renin. Right now, in my center or anywhere in the US, it takes about two weeks or so to get a renin back after you send a sample. So really, we can't really titrate with that, that kind of a turnaround time. So this was not just isolated. The group at the University of Maryland then goes on to repeat this experiment in a larger sample size, comes up with similar results that absolute renin and lactate doesn't make a difference. It both predict mortality. But the increase of renin and not the increase of lactate, it's over a 72 hours, is an independent um, a consideration or independently associated with mortality. So again, the delta renin appears to matter more than the delta lactate. And again, if you look at this slide, the top panel is a renin, more than 40 picograms per cc, more non-survivors than survivors, significant difference at all time points compared to lactate more than two. Again, mostly non-significant difference in the diseased versus alive. So clearly we've established some thresholds, we established that a change in renin appears important. And again, for those who are interested, I've summarized this in an editorial. We have compared Professor Belomo and our work, and the group from Gleason colleagues in Belgium and the group at, at Maryland, and, and lots, of data, lots of information here to sort of summarize how the evolution of renin has taken place. And really, it is renin kinetics and mortality, but, but maybe, maybe, maybe it is different. Each of the this sets of work is, is different. And, and finally, I'm going to share some unpublished data. This is from the Victus trial. You guys know, well know, vitamin C, thymine, and steroids. And, and, I'm, and I'm excited to say that we're seeing exactly the same signal. So in the blue is, is population median renin at baseline that is high. That's more than 188. In the red is less than 188. Remember, in ATHOS 3 post hoc, we had similar thresholds. And again, a significant difference, hazard ratio of three in terms of a, uh, a survival probability. Uh, and again, we've diced it in several ways. This is median renin on day three. The hazard ratio again is around three in terms of a difference in survival probability. For those who have high renin, the survival probability remains poor. We looked at median renin that was persistently high, so high on day zero and high on day three. Again. That, that survival probability difference is there. And then finally, 
take a patient who starts with normal renin and goes up versus take a patient who starts with normal renin and the trajectory goes down. We separated that as well. And again, the signal remains consistent that an increasing trajectory to renin portends a poor survival probability compared to a decreasing trajectory to renin. So very interesting data. Third, independent validation of the renin and high output shock and, and how maybe exogenous angiotensin II may be beneficial. Um, going back to the, to the lab, uh, the, the, here is in, the in, interesting data for those interested in septic shock. This is from the University of San Francisco. They looked at the effect of lipopolysaccharide, and, and they found that the permeability of the endothelial membrane Epinephrine and norepinephrine appear to stabilize that increased permeability, but not angiotensin II or vasopressin. So every vasopressor, again, seems to have a role. Angiotensin II, uh, again, there's lots of data in the cardiac surgical operating room, but this is important mechanical circulatory support. This was a three-institutional effort. Um, ourselves, Emory, and Mayo Clinic, we pooled data and we did see angiotensin II used in a ECMO patient population, largely ECMO, had a fairly stable measures of hemodynamics. Uh, here you can see pulmonary artery pressure and, and cardiac index changes. Uh, again, uh, there was a lot of concern around its effects on the right side of the heart, and we did not see any sort of safety signal issue here. More to follow in this space. So I'm going to transcend a little bit towards microcirculation now because we've focused on vasopressors that clamp down and increase afterload. Again, Slide says Batman and Superman story of critical care resuscitation, and that story continues. We've been fighting that battle of whether a blood pressure we see tra translates into microcirculation. Um, looks like uh, there's an issue, right? So this is sublingual uh, pictures or, or, or slides. These are video clips um, that are taken, can we play it, uh, from a healthy microcirculation sublingual capillary bed versus a patient on three pressors. This is the ATHOS-3 trial. You see how different the microcirculation is, even though blood pressure is exactly the same. So what are we doing with our vasopressors? Are we impairing microcirculation at the cost of seeing a good number at the bedside? So let me then go towards the venous side. We've, we've had Professor DeBacher talk about it, and I'm going to talk about some newer evidence here. Normal physiology on the left side of, of the screen venous pressure, intravascular volume, we all know this, venous return. Take the example of hypovolemic shock, decrease intravascular volume, decrease venous pressure, venous return decreases, preload, blood pressure, cardiac output follows, and decreased tissue perfusion. So what can we do to correct? We can either increase intravascular volume, but you know, in septic shock, the tank is already so big, I don't know where we're gonna go. In hypovolemic shock, either there's bleeding or there is severe hypovolemia, we can give more fluid, but we can also cause venoconstriction. So Professor DeBacher talked a little bit about how there's vasopressors, and, but the problem, or you know, the good and bad about vasopressors is that they do affect the arterial side of the circulation more than the venous side. Uh, we are looking at this new agent, Centaquin citrate, that was briefly talked about. So alpha-2b and alpha-2a action the venous circulation is rich in alpha-2 receptors, as we've already discussed. So what this agent does, theoretically, increase venous tone, venoconstriction, increase venous return, increase preload, and then decrease sympathetic outflow that's going to cause vasodilatation, decrease SVR, and help improve forward flow. Um, very new agent, but the evidence so far, most of it comes from small trials and studies in India, is interesting. Without going into uh, too many depths here, the, the, the preclinical work, we've already shown that, uh, Daniel showed some of that. Phase two, phase one, phase two, phase three has all been done, but very small sample sizes, um, 25 healthy volunteers in phase one, showing a wide safety margin. Maximum tolerated dose about 10 times the therapeutic dose, which, which is always good news. It shows a wide margin of safety. Short T half, so about uh, 0.7 to one and a half hours is this uh, plasma T half. Followed by phase two trial in, in 50 patients with hypovolemic shock. Outcomes being improved blood pressure, improved lactate, and an improved base deficit. And well tolerated, as again, in the phase two trial. Phase three trial, Bigger trial, randomized trial, 105 patients with hypovolemic shock, 
and a placebo arm as well. Interesting part, about 9% reduction in 28 days, all-cause mortality. However, this was a non-significant difference, and the trial was not powered for mortality. So, so the data is very interesting and, and very encouraging, but what do we do next? So let me talk in the last two minutes about both of these agents, angiotensin II, first of all. So as we can see, the high renin phenotype of shock appears to be really significant. So we really, really need a bedside point-of-care renin assay to help us guide precision-based biomarker therapy with angiotensin II. We need to look at the cardiac surgical population because ACE dysfunction seems to be evident in that population. I would say we need to keep looking at mechanical circulatory support. Initial data is encouraging. I came here five years ago to first talk about angiotensin II. That, that was a small phase three trial. We need to build on it. We obviously do need to do at some stage a larger RCT, comparing it head to head with another vasopressor, but with appropriate endpoints. And I'll say that again, with appropriate endpoints. Immune modulation, uh, Professor Baloma is gonna talk about that. And then uh, flow dynamics, uh, hopefully some speakers to, to follow. And then early multimodal vasopressors, which is another uh, pet peeve of mine, we'll, we'll do that as well. And in the last 30 seconds, well, Senthequin, what next? I've already said, told you the initial data. Of, there is a planned phase three trial, both in the US and in the EU. The FDA has given approval to a phase three trial protocol in the US. The EMA seems to be in broad agreement with that. But again, appropriate endpoints, sample sizes, and patient populations are absolutely necessary. That has been the limitations of the work so far. So in the bold here, the four final points are look at tissue perfusion, cardiac output, look at actual measurements, look at actual measurements of microcirculation, need for fluid resuscitation. Hopefully there's less fluid needed in the, in the veno constriction group, and then look at mortality as well. Thank you all for your patience. Short question. Thank you very much, Ashish, for your presentation. Short question, short answer. You said the effects of uh, angiotensin II may be related to the level of renin. But renin is also related to mortality and linked to lactate, or at least associated with lactate. So, the observation you made regarding the efficacy of angiotensin II, isn't it related only to the severity of the patients, or is it related really to the renin level? If you separate populations on lactate, for instance, do you have the same results? Or Yeah, so the data so far is, is uh, observational studies or retrospective studies where we've gone back and looked at it, or, or observational studies have, have been done. Really, you'd have to randomize the population and say, this was a patient with a high renin, this was a patient with a normal renin, we gave angiotensin II to both patients, also did lactate at the same time, and then we followed them out for uh, survival benefit to really answer your question. Um, I will say that th so far, uh, you know, like our post-hoc analysis with ATOS3, we did have synthetic angiotensin II used to see that there was a difference in survival. The Victus trial did not use angiotensin, so I wouldn't be able to comment on that. And the other observational work, again, did not use synthetic angiotensin to correct the renin. Thanks again. We can't seem to get enough about angiotensin too, so now we have Ronaldo Bolomo from the University of Melbourne in Australia to tell us more about that. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have Ashish kind of introduce the topic and to take it a little bit further for you. Uh, this is my conflict of interest statement. You've heard from Ashish on the ATHOS trial. It was published in the New England now six years ago, showing that the administration of angiotensin II in critically ill patients compared to placebo was markedly more effective in restoring target blood pressure and maintaining the target blood pressure in patients with refractory septic shock requiring high-dose catecholamines. This is a pictorial representation of what angiotensin II can do. You can see the clear response to its administration. And after that, clinicians didn't have to continue to use it. If they wanted to, they could. And you can see that if they could use it, and they did use it, the blood pressure was kept higher because it was a lot easier to do it with this new additional vasopressor agent. So it looks very effective in this regard. And this is a couple of mile curve from the ATHOS trial, 
which was designed as an FDA approval trial for the pressure effect of the agent, not for mortality. But you would be very happy if this was your drug, and this is the kind of Kaplan-Meier curve you would see in 300 patients only, so it's kind of reassuring that at least it's not particularly bad for you. You've already heard from Ashish that there are, it appears, secret worlds behind the phenotype that you see in people with vasodilator shock. There is an endotype, and it's a RAS endotype. I'm sure there are a million endotypes, but this is one that we can investigate it. And this is data from the Aethos trial showing that, as you can see there, the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 ratio is about four times higher in patients with vasodilatory shock compared to normal individuals, indicating that there is an inability to change angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 in a significant proportion of critically ill patients with vasodilatory shock. And you could say, well, who cares? You know, it doesn't really matter, except that it's very strongly associated with patient outcomes. So if you're in vasodilatory shock and you cannot make angiotensin 2 from angiotensin 1 the way you should, then you're pretty sick and you're more likely to die. And so that creates a paradigm and a paradigm goes like this. The endotype of some patients with vasodilatory shock is one that there is a block in the formation of angiotensin II. You cannot make it in an efficient way. And so the angiotensin I is diverted into a different pathway, which we will discuss in a minute, which is the non-canonical RAS pathway, which goes in the direction of angiotensin one and nine and angiotensin one and seven that are vasodilators. And of course, goes in the direction of bradykinin, which is a vasodilator. If you come in, on the side and you administer exogenous angiotensin II, then you make all the difference to blood pressure because these people are relatively deficient of that. And of course, of course, if you have a deficiency of angiotensin II because of the feedback inhibition of renin, you would expect that the renin level will be elevated. And then you come up with a different paradigm that says, look, if we measure renin, and you've already heard from Ashish, you would expect that the people with a high renin level would have a low angiotensin II level and would be more likely to die and also would be more likely to respond to the administration of angiotensin II because they are likely to be angiotensin II deficient and low and behold, as she showed you, this is true. How nice is that? We don't really see that very often. So most of you will be familiar with the RAS system and the concept that angiotensin II is generated from angiotensin I, and it's got effects on vasopressin secretion, the sympathetic system, sodium retention, water retention. That's all very good, it's all very well, that's what you learn in medical school. But the reality is that, like everything in biology, there are layers and layers and layers, and there is a non-canonical system that deals with angiotensin II and transforms it via the activity of ACE2 or via the activity of dipeptyl peptidases into other angiotensin II-derived products like angiotensin 1.9 and angiotensin 1.7, and they bind to an oncogene-derived uh, transmembrane receptor, and they activate all sorts of cell mechanisms. So when you give an angiotensin II, you modify this non-canonical pathway as well, and the world is really complicated. And if you want to get really complicated and you're interested in this world and you come to understand that there's a family of angiotensins, here is uh, five of them. Uh, it might well be a lot more complicated. Some of them are neurotransmitters. Some of them have an effect on memory and learning in the brain. Some of them are being tested for the treatment of dementia. It's a very complicated family, and the reality is really tricky. But let me take you back about the effect on mortality. So we've shown you all these effects of angiotensin II and blood pressure. We've shown you the effect in high renin patients. How could it be that a drug, that's just a vasopressor drug, is going to be able to modify outcome? And one way to try to understand it is to understand whether it has an effect on opsonization of bacteria. And this is a study done with my colleagues at Cornell, led by Daniel Leisman. The first thing is that you can do an animal model of sickle ligation puncture and administer A, angiotensin II, B, placebo, and then angiotensin II with low sartan, which is an angiotensin II receptor blocker, to see what happens. And as you can see there, there is a dramatic effect of angiotensin II, which is blocked by low sartan on just about, in fact, on every cytokine measure. There's eight of them. It's a panel. So it turns out that angiotensin II is not just a vasopressor, but in animal models, in a blinded study, it is a very powerful immune modulator. Not a surprise there, given the pervasiveness 
of the RAS. Another way of representing this is the growth of bacteria from the peritoneum and from the blood if you give angiotensin II intraperitoneally, if you give angiotensin II subcutaneously, and the difference if you give angiotensin II plus adlosartan to blockade its effect on the angiotensin II receptor. And you can see you don't have to be a scientist or a particularly complicated individual to see that if you give angiotensin II, bacteria don't grow. And so this is a very powerful effect, and it's not only immunomodulatory, but opsonizing. Another way is to represent it again uh, with a graphic format, and you see the effect of angiotensin II given either subcutaneously or intraperitoneally in terms of uh, blood cultures and in terms of intraperitoneal growth. So what is the mechanism? How does this work? And one way to do that is to generate knockout mice where you remove the angiotensin I receptor from myeloid cells, myeloid precursors of macrophages and neutrophils, and you can see there that there is a significant effect if you've got uh, myeloid cells that are positive for the receptor. If you've got knockout mice that do not have the receptor, you completely lose the opsonizing effect and the bacterial growth blocking effect of angiotensin II. So it appears to be clearly mediated by the angiotensin II receptor. How does it work? What does angiotensin II do to macrophages and neutrophils to make them opsonize and kill bacteria? And the answer is it stimulates their activity to phagocytose uh, when they're stimulated with lipopolysaccharide. And this activity appears to be partly mediated by the generation of radical oxygen species to help kill bacteria. So that's just kind of interesting. So angiotensin II is not just a vasopressor. It kills bacteria. It helps opsonize bacteria by acting on white cells to stimulate radical oxygen species production, to stimulate phagocytosis. It does so via the angiotensin type 1 receptor. Does it do anything else in terms of inflammation and effects? And this is work done by Jean-Louis' group here in uh, Brussels, where pigs were given fecal peritonitis and then were randomized to receive norepinephrine versus angiotensin II support and they were studied for a variety of physiological and biological consequences. Uh, there were no dramatic physiological consequences. Their blood pressure was maintained, the cardiac output was maintained, there were equivalent effects in terms of hemodynamics, but there were not equivalent effects in terms of myocardial inflammation. And you can see there that we end, end administration of angiotensin II, we're looking at myocardial cells, there is a clear decrease in all the markers of inflammation of the myocardium. So it turns out that angiotensin II vasopressor support is associated with decreased myocardial inflammation compared not to placebo this time, but compared to the administration of norepinephrine. And you say, well, you know, this is biological stuff, these are pigs, you know, what the heck, who cares? But this is now published last week. This is the first study of using angiotensin II as the primary vasopressor in patients with vasodilatory shock. So this is a before and after study in patients with vasodilatory shock. They were, randomized, they were treated in a control population with uh, the administration of uh, norepinephrine, and then another group was treated with the administration of angiotensin II. And there was similar mortality, although the pattern was in favor of angiotensin II. This is not power to show mortality effect. Things were all going in the right direction for angiotensin II, but there is no significant effect except for a decrease in ICU mortality in favor of angiotensin II. But the thing that is interesting is the striking observation that in these patients, the release of troponin at troponin levels was significantly attenuated by the administration of angiotensin II compared to norepinephrine, which is consistent with the animal experiments you've just seen uh, reported here in Belgium. So angiotensin II appears to be an effective novel vasopressor drug. It can be used to rescue patients with catecholamine resistant septic shock. How it may be life-saving catecholamine resistant septic shock may depend on the renin level, but its mechanism of action may not be just related to the vasopressor effect, but it might be really complex and may not just include the canonical RAS system, but the non-canonical RAS, can, RAS system, and potentially its effect on the immune function. It appears that this agent increases opsonization, it increases neutrophil and macrophage ability to opsonize and kill bacteria, and 
this effector B is mediated by radical oxygen species generation, and it modulates the inflammatory response by affecting cytokines across the board, and compared to norepinephrine, it decreases myocardial inflammation, something that we've now seen uh, in a primary initial investigation of its use as a primary vasopressor in vasodilatory shock. And if you become an angiotensin fan, like I have become, you can get yourself this book of 800 pages dedicated to angiotensin-related metabolism, activity, physiology, and potential effects on every aspect of the human body. Thank you very much. Ronaldo, after that, I'm not quite sure how we ever have gotten along without angiotensin II. Well, that's right. But, you know, luckily you make it. You're okay. You're doing okay. Every time you stand up, angiotensin II comes out, raining gets going, and you feel good. However, if you have septic shock and you're one of those people that cannot make angiotensin II, you'll be in trouble. So let me ask you this mechanistic question. A lot of what you've now spoken about in terms of vascular tone, immune biology, and oxygenization function, as well as toxic oxygen metabolite generation, sounds like the sphingosin 1-phosphate pathway. How does that relate to angiotensin 2? We, we don't have enough information on those pathways. No one actually has done randomized controlled comparative studies. It's a, a very reasonable hypothesis. What is clear is how pervasive this system and how highly conserved it is and, and how complex it is. And before we can unravel all this, you know, it will take decades. Uh, but for the first time, for the first time, we have an agent that is effective as a potential alternative to catecholamines. For the first time, we can study decatecholaminization. So where is Mervyn Singer, who always bangs on about it? For the first time, we are in a situation to actually test whether giving catecholamines to maintain blood pressure and vasodilatory sepsis instead of another agent is indeed injurious, as we've suspected for some time. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. The next talk will be given by Jan Becker from the Erasmus Medical University in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Jan, what is this vasopressor test you want to speak about? I'd rather not, but I mean, I have to. Um, I, I think one of the things, if you want to improve or decatecholize your patient, use less vasopressors. And I hope to make the point uh, later on in the, um, in the presentation. <clears throat> I have uh, no disclosures. This is data from the Andromeda 1, and I would love to have a disclosure because both Andromeda 1 and 2 are not supported by any granting because the granting agency said this is completely rubbish. Capillary refill time in clinical practice doesn't make any sense. So that's a dream that disappeared. Now, if we think about a circulatory uh, failure, uh, there is, of course, this focus on arterial pressure. And it's not that arterial pressure doesn't make any sense, because you need a difference in pressure before and after an organ to have perfusion. But at the end of the day, you don't die of a low pressure. You die of absent flow. And so um, the question is, does this focus on uh, arterial pressure, and, and even if it's the, the level of 65 doesn't make any sense um, if you want to improve perfusion, because that's the goal of maintain of, of let's say manipulating pressure. It's not to have a pressure; it's to have an adequate blood flow. So that's the question, and and uh, we all know this uh, uh, relationship <clears throat> between blood pressure and and organ blood flow, um, and and there is this uh, oh, auto regulation. Uh, in this area, but I think in a vasodilatory state, like for instance septic shock, I think there is this. There is a uh, almost linear relationship between blood pressure in organs that rely on blood pressure, of course. Um, and uh, the real question then is, um, when we think a high target gives high perfusion pressure, the question then is, um, if you have a low mean arterial pressure, does this um, lead to a higher perfusion 
uh, of the organ. Because, remember, if you uh, decrease vessel diameter, um, you decrease flow. If you dilate a vessel, you significantly improve flow. And that's, let's say, the results of all the studies that we did on nitroglycerin, on capillary refill time or peripheral perfusion, nitroglycerin on the microcirculation, vasodilation gets a huge increase in, uh, in, in flow. The problem is we cannot measure the flow through the kidneys. Well, we can use resistance index with echo, but that's rather complicated. Um, but in general, a vasodilation makes much more sense than increasing the, the tone of the, um, of the vessels. Now, we know that uh, uh, different organs have different resistance to decreases in mean arterial pressure. And uh, uh, we heard a lot about the kidney, especially the kidney uh, doesn't tolerate very well decreases in uh, mean arterial pressure. The question is why? Um, I think there's a lot to do about the post-capillary pressure in the kidney. Um, but there is a relationship between mean arterial pressure and uh, uh, organ blood flow. The problem is, um, as stated in the conclusion of this paper as well, we have no clue because we can't measure it. Now, if you go into the literature and you look at vasopressor agents, and at that time, uh, at this uh, time of this uh, um, analysis of available evidence in literature, there was only uh, norepinephrine. And if you look at uh, the effect of norepinephrine in septic shock, remember very small studies, all of these, uh, they looked at uh, uh, the microcirculation under the tongue. They looked at uh, tonometry, so perfusion of the gut, um, laser Doppler flow, uh, stuff like that, peripheral circulation. Um, very disappointing, no effect. So you manipulate the blood pressure with norepinephrine, and basically nothing much happens to organ perfusion. Oh, this is much better. Um, then Toft uh, looked at changes in, uh, in uh, arterial pressure, and interesting, read the, the title of, the, uh, uh, of this paper. Arterial pressure, organ perfusion, and measuring peripheral circulation. And so we, there is a, a, a thought that uh, peripheral circulation somehow reflects organ perfusion, which is unknown, to be honest. Uh, but at least when he, when he looked at the nurse uh, variables, and so that's peripheral circulation of the uh, hand or the microcirculation under the tongue, and he looked at different blood pressures, no effect. However, there was inter-individual uh, changes. So some individuals improved with higher blood pressure, and improved, for instance, from 65 to 70, and then decreased when they went to 75. And so the individual is very different than the mean. And I think the worst you can do is treat patients on means of studies, uh, because you completely neglect the individual effect of raising blood pressure or changing uh, blood pressure. Uh, Arnaldo Dubin did a study where he looked at uh, microcirculatory blood flow and increasing arterial pressure. In general, he said there was no, uh, not much effect, but especially in the patient with poor perfusion, he found that uh, increasing the blood pressure had a more positive effect. Again, individual changes, some uh, dramatically dropped the microcirculatory perfusion under the tongue, whereas others significantly improved and didn't change from 75 to 85 again. So if you want to manipulate blood pressure, then use the NS1 experiment in your patient. Why um, is, uh, let's say, this focus on peripheral circulation uh, uh, relevant? Well, there's only one study where we showed that if you have abnormal peripheral perfusion in a patient with septic shock, and you try to measure perfusion of kidneys, liver, intestine, and spleen, then the longer your capillary refill time, the worse your perfusion. And a resistance index is not easy to get. Interestingly, when you ask uh, uh, the uh, investigators in Austria, Brunauer, uh, how long did it take you to get the resistance index in the vasodilatory state? He said, well, about five minutes. In the vasoconstrictive state, he was at the bedside for an hour, an hour and a half to get the resistance index, indicating 
vasoconstriction, high capillary refill time, has low blood flow, whatever the blood pressure, because this is not blood pressure oriented. And so that's the relevance of, let's say, connecting the biomarker, which is the peripheral circulation, to organ perfusion. And then we're interested in what is mean arterial pressure doing. Well, we know uh, from the ASFAR study that a higher blood pressure doesn't make a lot of difference, maybe somewhat less kidney failure, um, but there was not a really lower blood pressure. There was not a low blood pressure. I love a blood pressure of 50 or maybe even lower in a vasodilatory state, of course. Um, so the, the mean arterial pressure was around 75, uh, which is not really low blood pressure. So we did the Andromeda 1 study where we showed that if you use capillary refill time as a biomarker or lactate as a biomarker to, let's say, change therapy, that it's better to use capillary refill time than lactate. Um, and in all subgroup analysis, we showed basically that you st should stop measuring lactate after, after two hours because it doesn't add anything anymore. What we did in this study is try to personalize the treatment as much as possible. And so we had three tiers in this study. First, we did fluids. And then if the patient was chronically hypertensive, and this is from the ASFAR study, we started with a vasopressor test. And so what we did is we increased the blood pressure to 75 or higher and, and monitored the effect on capillary refill time. If the patient responded great, we, we kept the patient at a higher blood pressure. If nothing happened, the patient was taken off, and then they did a dobutamine challenge, uh, 2.5 or 5 uh, microgram per kilo per minute of dobutamine. If the patient was not hypertensive, they immediately went to the dobutamine. I will show you the results of the vasopressor. Now, in this uh, study, it, it turned out to be very difficult to do a vasopressor test. Uh, the, let's say, the, when you put it in writing, it's very simple. Increase norepinephrine until your mean arterial pressure is 75. How complicated can it be? But it turned out that many patients didn't tolerate. They got uh, low blood pressure, for instance, when you increase norepinephrine. Uh, they got very high blood pressure. They became bradycardic. Um, and so there were a lot of complications, um, maybe related to the speed by which you increase norepinephrine, because we didn't didn't give any guidance. So in, in general, we had, uh, in total, we have 14 patients in the peripheral perfusion group and 25 patients in the lactate group where they try to study the effect of increasing blood pressure on the biomarker. The biomarker for peripheral perfusion was capillary refill time, normalization, and for lactate, either a 20% decrease in two hours or normalization. And so remember, the time constant for this study is completely different. This is uh, uh, less than an hour because capillary refill time responds very fast and lactate is two hours. There's nothing compared to renin where you have to wait for two weeks for a result. So this, it's still very fast, but remember there is a, a huge difference in the time constant. So many patients didn't, they did the, uh, the uh, vasopressor test, but there were no meaningful results for very uh, various reasons. I won't go into that. When you look at the effect of manipulating the blood pressure on your biomarker, um, well, there was a significant effect. I mean, they, they managed to get the blood pressure up to high levels, and, and not, um, let's say, a lot of norepinephrine was needed to get to these higher blood pressures. There was a significant decrease in lactate and capillary refill time, but on average, they never got to a normal level. Uh, this is pre, and so lactate would be here. Capillary refill time would be here. They never reached a normal level by just increasing blood pressure. But if you look at the individual changes, the, the, uh, the picture becomes very different. Because this is... Uh, delta mean arterial pressure, so the increase in mean arterial pressure, and the change in capillary refill time. And so how many patients did decrease, uh, did improve their capillary refill time, so decrease from abnormal to maybe less abnormal or even normal? Um, the, the majority. The majority had an improvement in the biomarker. 
had an improvement in capillary refill time. But there were some, there was no change, a significant increase in blood pressure and nothing changed. And, and this, of course, is worrisome. You increase vasoconstriction. That's probably never good. Um, if you manipulate blood pressure and you increase your capillary refill time, and the study of Brunauer is okay, you're shutting down kidney perfusion, liver perfusion, gut perfusion, and spleen perfusion. That can never be the objective of having a higher blood pressure. And so if you look at the individual changes, you cannot make a recommendation. You cannot make a recommendation that if, if a patient with previous hypertension has abnormal capillary refill time, you should increase the blood pressure. That's probably very false. That's not okay to do. If you look at lactate, it's about the same. Uh, overall, uh, there was a decrease in lactate when you increased the, pure, the, uh, uh, the mean arterial pressure. Again, those two, uh, two patients where there was hardly any uh, change. Uh, and this is probably also no change, but uh, in, in this patient where you have a rise of two in lactate in two hours when you increase perfusion, uh, increase mean arterial pressure, that's probably not a good idea. Now, interestingly, in some patients, they did the wrong thing. Uh, ultimately, in clinical practice, it was a very good intervention. So instead of increasing the norepinephrine, they decreased the norepinephrine. Um, and so they lowered the blood pressure. And then in these, let's say, seven patients where they did the wrong test, uh, that's interesting because in uh, the majority of these patients, except two, there was a, uh, uh, an improvement. So this is uh, uh, blood pressure, um, and this is the decrease in uh, uh, blood pressure, 96. I mean, that's very high in septic shock, to be honest. So they decreased norepinephrine to get to 83, and capillary refill time fell, 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 and fell. And so decreasing the blood pressure from, um, I think we all agree, a somewhat inadequate high level um, uh, improved. And so too much blood pressure is also not good. And uh, again, it's the individual because in this guy, when they decreased from 80 to 60, there was uh, a decrease in peripheral perfusion. And so this patient was uh, probably in need of a higher mean arterial pressure. Okay. In the Andromeda 2, we will do exactly the same. We now have around 450 patients in the study. Uh, we will go to 1,500 as the endpoint. Uh, and basically, we do the same thing, vasopressor test and inodilator test. So in conclusion, the vasopressor test relies on principles of perfusion pressure and pathophysiological vasoconstriction. Abnormal perfusion press, uh, uh, peripheral perfusion is related to increased morbidity, mortality, and bad organ perfusion. Uh, there is not much evidence that increasing mean arterial pressure as a general goal leads to a better outcome. The previous speakers have showed that. Increases in mean arterial pressure by increasing norepinephrine are associated with improving capillary refill time and lactate levels, but not as a general guideline. Remember, you have to do NS1 experiments. Uh, the vasopressor test is an ultimate example of individualized care. That's what I think. That's why the nurses don't like it. It's too much work. Never should the averages of studies like this be used as recommendations and guidelines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. It's very, very interesting. In fact, it's, isn't it about the meaning of this uh, capillary refill time? What's inside and what explains this uh, time needed for reperfusion? I mean that it is influenced by what's likely by MAP, because it is the, and the pressure at entrance. But when you give norepinephrine, you have a double effect. You increase MAP but also you induce vasoconstriction that may lengthen the reperfusion and the increase in, uh, in capillary refill time. So, in fact, isn't all these results, aren't they due to the fact that you have opposite effect when you give norepinephrine on CRT? 
Well, that's the interesting point when you, when you look at the patient where they decreased uh, norepinephrine, mm. but that's in a very abnormal state. Why would you want your septic shock patient to be in a mean arterial pressure of 96? That's probably very inadequate. And, and to be honest, when I came from, from the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is vasodilation country, to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, we like warm and well-perfused patients with low blood pressures. And I came to the United States for the first time in 10, 20 years, I saw all these patients with cold hands and feet and mottled skin on norepinephrine. Uh, I hadn't seen that for a very long time. So you can have too much vasopressors, absolutely. Capillary refill time will tell you that it's too much, but norepinephrine, of course, is a somewhat complex agent. Um, so it increases blood pressure, but also increases cardiac output. And, and you never know why the capillary refill time actually changes. Is it because of the increase in cardiac output or the increase in blood pressure or the combination? So it's, it's a little bit complex. Um, but I think the vasopressor test is something to be used in individualized care. Find the best blood pressure for your patient. And one thing is vasopressor test, capillary refill time. The other thing that I always do, a patient that doesn't pee, I increase the blood pressure and see if they need a higher perfusion pressure for the kidney. So that's individualized care and capillary refill time is just one of them. That's very interesting. I have a follow-up question. Since we know that pH influences the ability of your red cell to deform and has some relationship to the no reflow phenomenon, what is the relationship of pH to the vasopressor test and its follow-up with capillary refill? A great question, and I have no answer. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't measure the pH, uh, but it's, it's a great question. Um, and uh, I, I, ca I cannot give you the answer. Uh, I can only uh, look at the data and let's say take a blood sample that we took somewhat later. Uh, the, the interesting thing about the vasopressor test, it was rather early in resuscitation when they did it. So we could look at, let's say the first blood gas, but I have no uh, before and after blood samples. Very good, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sharon Arnov from Jerusalem, and she's going to talk to us about combination therapies in septic shock, when and how. Welcome, Sharon. So um, I'm really glad to be at the, the end of the session, um, mainly because what I'm going to be showing you is the difference between when you're sitting in enterprise and doing the theory of uh, oh, wow, this is great, you know, all the physiology and the actual evidence, which is when you land in the real world. Uh, so here's the, we're going to start with my conflicts of interest, which there are none. And I'm going to start with the guidelines talking about um, adults in septic shock. For the second drug, the recommendation is to start vasopressin uh, instead of escalating the dose of norepinephrine. And that is when arterial pressures are below what we would expect. So I'm going to start with the justification for adding rather than escalating. Uh, you've all heard for exactly two hours about this. I'm not going to elaborate about this anymore. I don't think this is interesting from my perspective, which is a population's perspective. What I'm going to be showing you is clinical trials, which we would con consider for Cochrane if we were now running the evidence for this. So. Uh, Patients can be hypotensive and either responsive or non-responsive to catecholamines. However, uh, we know that norepinephrine has been associated with severe vasoconstriction. We've heard about that, and I'm going to show you the evidence for that. Excessive organ damage, perhaps, and these may con uh, contribute to poor patient outcomes. It's also been independently associated in at least two trials, and we've heard Jan Bakker right now uh, talk about that, that excessive norepinephrine can actually be uh, uh, detrimental for patient outcomes. Multimodal treatment, which has been proposed and I'm going to discuss in a minute, is considered more balanced. You give at least two drugs and probably uh, have less adverse effects because you're not peaking on any of those drugs and you're also less likely to generate what's called tachyphylaxis. 
So what's actually being administered out there? This is a survey that we, we ran uh, a couple of years ago using the uh, ESICAM uh, platform. And you can see in orange the difference in between continents in the, the amount of phenylephrine being used, or sorry, of a vasopressin actually being used around the world as a second drug. And I'm starting with vas uh, vasopressin because this is what's in the recommendations. So why vasopressin? We've already heard that there may be a relative uh, vasopressin deficiency in the first 24 hours. This is actually based on a single study. There is another study that has uh, looked at this in humans, but we know based on these few human uh, people, these few humans who have contributed their blood, that there seem to be elevated levels in early septic shock and the levels seem to decrease. Again, we're talking less than 30 individuals. We've heard about the beneficial uh, mechanisms of action, which I'm not going to go into. So this justifies this in theory. Experimental models also show synergy. If you put vasopressin with nor noradrenaline, there are two studies showing some synergistic effect. I'm talking about synergy at the physiological level, not synergy in terms of decreasing dose. Vasopressin also apparently has some synergism with angiotensin II, and with, with additional alpha-2 uh, adrenoreceptor agonists. So the guidelines also say that the mortality is, is reduced. And what, they, and what they did basically is they pulled the data together. They found 10 studies, and they looked at those, and they found that they, uh, a reduction in mortality. Now, I would point out that 0 0.99 is grazing the number one. If you're a pedant, you would say that you don't have enough data to, to claim a reduction in mortality. And why am I saying this? Because they first uh, cite the VANISH trial, uh, which has been uh, mentioned several times here. And you can see the structure of the trial. It was a head-to-head -head trial of vasopressin versus norepi. Uh, patients were then, uh, when, the ran when the maximal rate was achieved, patients were randomized to receive hydrocortisone. And if the patients remained hypotensive, then they received an additional drug, an additional, some sort of catecholamine. This trial, the primary outcome was actually kidney failure, and so the, 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 da the data set was not calculated, the sample size was not calculated for mortality, and indeed 28-day mortality was unchanged. The VAST trial, which is also cal uh, uh, cited very much in the, um, in the guidelines for the second drug, is again a multicenter uh, trial. And again, don't understand, I'm not saying anything bad about these drugs, I'm just saying as a methodologist how you would view these trials. The, 28-day mortality was indeed the primary outcome uh, for this study, but they didn't show any, any difference in mortality. What they did show in subgroup analysis was that patients with less severe shock perhaps uh, benefited from receiving vasopressin as a second drug. So what about other meta-analyses? In this meta-analysis, there are actually two that pooled uh, studies that 100% had noradrenaline in the, um, in the uh, comparator group and vasopressin and noradrenaline in the intervention group. These are the only, there are only four entirely clean uh, studies on this topic. And when looking at this data, you can see no difference. So this is one of them. The other one, which I'm going to mention, is an individual patient data level meta-analysis. We actually looked at the data um, up to 2022, and this, uh, this has just been re recently published. And this table was basically a systematic review of the literature. And you can see what, uh, what exists um, in that table, which um, most of it is in the supplement. I also made a whole list of p papers that would be considered pa perhaps RCTs, but would have been excluded by Cochrane for various methodological reasons. And this study, in, in, in this table, you can see only one study, the one um, by Oliveira that showed a difference in mortality in terms of uh, adding vasopressin to norepinephrine. Now, having said that, this study also didn't calculate sample size. They didn't say what their primary outcome was. They just did a comparison, and they didn't calculate sample size for that primary outcome. What about other drugs? So what's out there? Let's really see. Now, we've heard for two hours about fantastic, you know, science fiction. This has been science fiction. I loved it just as much as you did. But let's see what's really in the literature for our patients. So what are their options are there? And I'm just going to be uh, touching on this a little bit because I don't have time for all of these. So um, multiple options. Some of these are catecholamines, vasopressors, inotropes. Some of them have mixed effects, as you can see here. And I'll start with epinephrine. 
And the guidelines say that epinephrine can be used for patients with a, a um, reduced uh, cardiac output, per perhaps more of a congestive heart failure situation. And uh, actually, the only study that I found uh, comparing norepinephrine and vasopressin to, to norepinephrine with uh, epinephrine is something that was published um, in 2019. It was a retrospective study, and uh, they, they, they uh, uh, created both an unmatched and a matched cohort and found no difference. So in theory, um, if you don't isolate specific patients for receiving epinephrine, at the moment we don't have much data. This is all there is. With regards to uh, patients with congestive heart failure, um, again, this is indirect uh, evidence. This, these are patients with heart failure, that, and we assume that what we know from cardiology is relevant to <clears throat> sepsis, but this is not entirely true. Just to put a little nuance on this, and I'm just going to continue in a minute showing you the evidence, there's a difference between men and women in the type of, of congestive heart failure that they have. Men have left-hearted failure. Women have right-hearted failure. Does epinephrine work similarly on both sides of the heart in sepsis? Good question. We don't know. Terlipressin. So for this, only three, uh, three studies. Two of them have no comparator. They're essentially, um, let's put it, uh, uh, elaborate case, uh, case series. And the third one is quite recent from, uh, from 2022, was published in a renal paper, paper because their main outcome was ultrasound signal for renal perfusion. And, and the number of uh, uh, patients is right before you. You can see 15, 8, 22. I mean, okay. Celepressin, there are absolutely no studies uh, using this as a second drug. It's not available anyway. And dibutamine, we know, I mean, we, I grew up on dibutamine, and yet, there is absolutely no single study that is sufficiently powered showing norepinephrine alone and norepinephrine versus dobutamine. And I think that the evidence uh, today, we, al we almost have like wiki type evidence for norepinephrine, justifies any study on a second drug to be compared against norepinephrine alone. Because the fact is, based on our survey, more than 95% of most practitioners everywhere are using norepinephrine, and that's before the guidelines came out the 2021 guidelines. Angiotensin II. Here you see the summary of the FDA. And again, not to take away from any of the really amazing work that some of my colleagues did, uh, the applicant that submitted the dossier for angiotensin II gave, um, gave all of the material to the FDA. And what they described are nine supportive clinical publications. Eight of these were small trials with sample sizes raising from, uh, ranging from six to 50 for a total of 93 subjects. This would have been excluded for a Cochrane review. Um, and 50% of these were healthy and 50% in shock. In other words, they didn't meet the population criteria for, uh, for justifying uh, inclusion. The ninth supported publication was a systematic review showing 31,000 patients, but these were not patients in septic shock. So the fact is that angiotensin II was approved, and this, this uh, statement actually says it, based on one trial, which you saw, which was targeted for blood pressure. And there's a whole discussion, as was uh, mentioned here by my colleagues, about the fact that maybe blood pressure is enough. We don't know that yet, and that's another question that I I'm going to show. So the, the, um, the angiotensin II trial, in fact, um, angiotensin II was given on top of noradrenaline when the dose was 0.2 mic per kilo per minute. The primary endpoint was a change in the mean arterial pressure, not, not mortality, and safety concerns were raised regarding thromboembolism. I'm not saying don't use it, I'm just saying use it with care. Phenylephrine, now here's a question. In theory, it's the same mechanism. They're both alpha, uh, cons uh, alpha constrictors, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine. And in fact, this study that you see here is the only study where you mix norepinephrine and phenylephrine together to see whether they've been uh, co uh, compared. And in this study, patients were receiving dopamine, and then either one or the other was given. Nobody's ever looked at the combination of the two of these. And there are differences in mechanism. It would seem unlikely that there would be an effect. I can tell you, we've tried this on our patient. It does work in some patients. <clears throat> I can't explain why. I'll let the physiology geniuses figure this out. But I do know that there does seem to be justification for considering this in the least. What about when? When to give the drug? 
So the first uh, uh, option would be to say what epinephrine, uh, what norepinephrine uh, uh, does. And this is what the guidelines say. The threshold uh, varies among studies, and that's true. Um, they say that they say it seems reasonable to them to give it between 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 micro per kilo per minute. In fact, the studies, um, the, the dose ranged between 0 0.01 to 0 0.01. But okay, you know, they selected that. I can't argue with that because the evidence really isn't out there. Um, human, like I mentioned before, human studies show that vasopressin levels increase in early shock. So perhaps we should give it very early on when, when we think the uh, vasopressin levels are, uh, the, 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 um, our own uh, vasopressin levels are decreasing. And in fact, the study mentioned by my colleague here from Greece said that every, for every hour delay and for every increase in the dose of nor, uh, norepi, the patients uh, probably died more. But again, this is a retrospective study. This needs to be looked at, looked at much more carefully. On the other hand, there are studies showing, showing that timing doesn't matter. Here's a meta-analysis focused on vasopressin within six hours or later than six hours and showing no difference in mortality. And the second one is the IPDMA, the Individual Patient Data Meta-Analysis of those four studies that definitely had only norepinephrine in the comparatory uh, limb. And these showed also no interaction with time to study, to, to study inclusion of the patients. So in fact, we don't really know enough about timing either. What about what blood pressure? I'm not even going to begin. I'll just you know, show uh, this very well uh, known paper and just run off to how much. Dose is usually fixed on zero, zero 0.3 and that's what the guidelines say, um, pretty much uh, focusing on the Gordon paper. Uh, but that trial was aimed to prevent renal failure. I would say, let's look at that one trial that actually changed mortality, and here the dose was lower. So I think that should be considered and perhaps even rethought. Um, higher doses of vasopressin have been associated with cardiac, digital, and splanchnic ischemia. We've heard that. Again, uh, you, you see what the guidelines uh, say. Uh, they didn't find this finding. And neither did others. This is a meta-analysis of uh, 23 trials, RCTs, not specifically in se septic shock, but in those uh, in those uh, in, that, in th those studies that did compare only to uh, nor norepinephrine with vasopressin, definitely the addition of vasopressin decreased uh, the risk of atrial fibrillation. This was also found in uh, this uh, again the individual patient data level meta-analyses, where they also found a little bit more true digital ischemia. And I agree that further evidence is needed to properly address the role of vasopressors in septic shock. What I didn't mention here, and nobody has mentioned today, is the fact that we're looking at one thing. We do not look at beta blockers. We did not look at steroids, except for uh, the VANISH trial. Long-term outcomes, yes, I agree. Mortality isn't all. Specific populations, pregnant women, pa patients with specific disabilities, heart failure, Cost effectiveness is important as well. True knowledge exists in knowing that you know nothing, and I think that's pretty much where we're standing on our second vasopressor, so please do some research on this. Thank you. As a surgeon, knowing nothing is very easy for me. What should we do? What, what trial would you design so that we would have appropriate population-based data? So, you know, much as I feel queasy about saying this, I would say that a platform trial would probably be the best, uh, best trial for this sort of thing. Because um, as um, mentioned by the previous talker, um, there are various considerations that come into play when we're looking at our different patients. And I think that a platform trial would be able to be more stepwise, would take into consideration patient variability better, and also different practice habits that pe people have in different places in the world. It would allow us to co collect data at various stages of the disease and not just have like one cohort that has been highly selected that we're following up on and we're um, not looking at the rest. I'd just like to point out that for many of these studies, if you look at the rate of data collection and how many study patients were recruited per, per center, it's tricky. You could find maybe one, two patients per center per month. So that way, with a platform trial, you get a lot more. Thank you very much again. Thank you.
You said, uh, Sharon, that uh, nobody had mentioned adding a vase, uh, beta blocker, but this will be mentioned now by Michel Chu from Linköping University in Sweden. Please, Michel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Monet. True knowledge exists when you realize you don't know anything. I think that sums up the next talk as well. So, uh, inotropes, when and how. I've got uh, three conflicts of interest to declare. So why use inotropes? When I go out and ask my residents why they use inotropes, most will say, well, I want to bring the blood pressure up. But usually, the specific goal of using any inotrope is to increase cardiac contractility. And via increasing cardiac contractility, you increase cardiac output and hopefully organ perfusion, but realize that there are actually variable effects on blood pressure, regional circulation and microcirculatory flow. So when you start up an infusion of dobutamine, your blood pressure might actually drop. Now, there are three main categories of um, inotropes, and forgive me if this is too basic, but I've been told to, um, to, to have a very, very basic talk. There's the adrenergic agents, the catecholamines, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and the calcium sensitizers. The question is, is there a need for concern? We know, for example, pathophysiologically, that beta adrenergic receptors are downregulated in sepsis. So perhaps it doesn't really make a lot of sense to start an infusion of dobutamine. The problem being, of course, it's the problem being that we being of course that we cannot measure beta receptor adrenal sensitivity in the clinical um, at the clinical bedside. We also know that catecholamines are associated with adverse events, mostly tachyarrhythmias but also digital and spastic ischemia. We know also that adrenergic agents may exacerbate and indeed they may actually cause septic cardiomyopathy. There are very real immunomodulatory effects of the catecholamines and perhaps the most disconcerting of all is the fact that no study has ever demonstrated the clinical benefit of any inotrope. So I'm bringing up this study, this is a SOAP2 study, because it does form the basis of our guidelines. So the two, SOAP2 study randomized almost 1,700 of patients with shock. So this is all sorts of shock, but two-thirds of the patients had septic shock to dopamine versus noradrenaline. And there was no difference in the primary outcome of 28-day mortality. In the subgroup of patients with cardiogenic shock, in fact, there was a signal to harm, increased mortality, and there was an increase in the incidence of tachyarrhythmias. So dopamine is no longer recommended for the treatment of shock. This is a CAT study, 330 patients, this time with septic shock, specifically septic shock, randomizing patients to receive dobutamine plus noradrenaline or adrenaline alone, and importantly, all patients had their mean arterial pressure titrated to over 70 millimeters of mercury. Now, the CAT study did not show a benefit in the primary outcome either. That was 28-day mortality. And there was a similar rate of adverse events, although the study was underpowered to show these. And there was a definite signal to harm with increased lactate levels as well as a decreased pH among the patients that received adrenaline. Well, the non-adrenergic inotropes, milrinone and levosimendan, so the phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors and the calcium channel sensitizers are pathophysiologically attractive because they avoid the adrenergic pathway altogether. However, there is no evidence of any benefit, in fact, even some suggestion for harm. So this is the Leopard's trial. So this is the Leopard's trial, um, randomizing about 600 patients to receive levosimendan plus standard care or placebo plus standard care. The primary outcome was organ dysfunction, measured as a SOFA score up to day 28. And there was no difference. And if anything, there was a signal towards poorer SOFA scores in patients receiving levosimendan. There was no signal to any benefit in terms of 28-day 28 uh, mortality. And in fact, liver cementin patients were less likely to be weaned from uh, invasive mechanical ventilation and suffered more tachyarrhythmias. Now, this study, 
the largest study to date of liver semendan has been criticized heavily for not doing an echocardiography among these patients prior to starting the drug. But having said that, and that is a reasonable criticism, but having said that, none of the studies of inotropes in shock have done an echocardiography prior to uh, giving the drug. So current recommendations of sepsis, and this is the latest SSCG guidelines, still recommend dobutamine as the first line agent for the treatment of septic shock. They also mention that mean arterial pressure should be restored, adding vasopressin to the mean arterial pressure to target uh, a particular map or to reduce the use of the catecholamines. And I'm very grateful to, to Dr. Aina for, um, for raising this because without raising your mean arterial pressure and without restoring your afterload, it is very difficult. And in fact, uh, any cardiac dysfunction may be unmasked when you actually restore afterload. There is also recommendation to add adrenaline to noradrenaline, specifically in patients that are bradycardic. So that was septic shock. What about cardiogenic shock? Well, here again, there is a recommendation, although a weak one, to use dobutamine for the treatment in cardi of cardiogenic shock to increase cardiac output. Levosimendan and phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors are preferable to dobutamine only if beta blockade is thought to be contributing to cardiac dysfunction and hypoperfusion. So this is a niche indication. However, levosimendan is not suitable for treatment of patients with cardiogenic shock unless it is in combination with other inotropes or vasopressors, and there was no recommendation for that, for that statement. So I want to refer you to this, uh, what I think is a very good paper that sums up the evidence on liver cemento. This was written by uh, Professor Sholley and colleagues, published in Critical Care recently. So you will see here that liver cemento is no longer recommended for the prevention of organ dysfunction and, um, and for the treatment of cardiac dysfunction in septic shock. However, in patients with decompensated heart failure, receiving beta blockers, where the beta blockers are thought to contribute to the cardiac dysfunction, there is a niche indication for levosimendan. For the prevention of low cardiac output syndrome following cardiac surgery, no, no longer recommended in the general cardiac surgery population, but perhaps, and this comes from a subgroup analysis of the LICON trial, perhaps in patients undergoing isolated coronary artery bypass. The one thing you should not do, and this is in the guidelines as well for cardiogenic shock, is not to use adrenaline. This is the individual patient data meta-analysis involving about 2,500 patients given adrenaline or another inotropic agent showing that adrenaline increases the short-term mortality regardless of how it's measured, whether it be 28-day, 30-day, or ICU mortality. And looking at the individual subgroups, you will see the signal to increase mortality. So anything above that stipple uh, blue line is increased mortality was found across all subgroups for adrenaline. So adrenaline is no longer recommended for the treatment of cardiogenic shock. So what about mildrenone? This uh, systematic review and meta-analysis with trial sequential an analysis is getting a little bit old, but it's still relevant. Mildrenone for cardiac dysfunction of any cause did not affect mortality or any of the secondary outcomes that were defined in those studies. Mildrenone versus dobutamine in sepsis was investigated in this big data trial. So this is, um, uh, well, it wasn't a trial. It's actually a retrospective study from the MIMIC-3 database using a propensity matched analysis showing that dobutamine uh, versus mildrenone were equivocal. However, there was a signal there was a signal to increase um, need for renal replacement therapy as well increase uh, hospital length of stay. However, and, and these findings are probably not robust. They were all uh, derived from the MIMIC-3 database. So this is the DOREMI trial, patients with cardiogenic shock, randomizing about 200 patients to receive mildenone versus dobutamine with a primary outcome that was composite um, of 
um, of uh, in-hospital mortality as well as a number of um, adverse outcomes, including um, major cardiovascular events and, and renal events. No differences in any of the primary or the separate secondary outcomes. And in this Cochrane study of cardiogenic shock and low cardiac output syndrome, found that there was no robust or convincing data to support any inotrope over another for the treatment of people with cardiogenic or low cardiac output syndrome. So in summary, we're back to the judicious, judicious use of dopamine in patients with hypoperfusion despite adequate fluid resuscitation and a restoration of MAP to over 65 in septic shock. Do consider adrenaline, but only if the patient is bradycardic, and levosimendan is no longer recommended except with that niche indication in patients on beta blockers where beta blockers are thought to contribute to cardiac dysfunction. For cardiogenic shock, there is no robust data to support the use of any inotrope. Again, the judicious use of dobutamine, although that is not based on any robust evidence, avoid adrenaline, and again, those niche indications for the phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors, so um, enoximone or mildrenone or levosimendan, amongst patients with cardiogenic shock where beta blockers are thought to contribute to cardiac dysfunction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Very didactic talk. What about the combination? Because, um, for instance, I remember the pharmacological studies showing um, an interest of adding milrinone or enoximin to the butamine, because pharmacologically it makes sense to add both. And um, so we know the last study with milrinone, but you think that um, but, but there was no addition. It was melanin versus the butamine. Do you think there may be um, an indication for adding both, especially at the late phases of uh, debut administration? Yeah, well, certainly pathophysiologically, it's an interesting concept. Um, it attacks the, uh, the, the, um, the pathology via two different pathways, you know, the butamine with direct beta effects and the vasodilatory response, and the milrinone with the phosphodiesterase 3 response. And this ties in with what, uh, what Dr. Ainoff mentioned before, that you may have additive effects of, of two drugs. Regarding... Um uh, regarding levosimendan, what we really like is a good study in cardiogenic shock. I mean that we have the studies in decompensated um, uh, heart failure, acute heart failure, but uh, no good study in shock. And in fact, it's that, that's typically what would be interesting for building recommendations. Right, cardiogenic that's, shock. Yeah, I mean. that's correct. I think, um, you know, most of the studies and Lycon and Cheetah and all of those studies were done in a decompensated heart failure in low cardiac output syndrome. You know, I guess it's, it's a gray area um, uh, in terms of what you would call shock. You know, if you have low cardiac output, perhaps you're in shock anyway. Um, I, I, I'd have to really think hard about how to design that study. Um, and I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I would go with just a single, uh, the single drug. And the same, the addition of levosimendan and the butamine has not been tested as well in refractory shock. And we will speak about refractory shock later. It may be interesting. One doesn't yeah. know again. Yeah, cardiogenic shock is difficult, you know, because it's such a, I mean, as, as with septic shock as well, it's such a heterogeneous um, uh, group of patients. And a lot of cardiogenic shock patients have, for example, you know, they've, they've, got, they've got big hearts, they're hypertrophy, they have, um, they have a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And, you know, starting any inotrope in, in, that, in that group would, would probably um, be deleterious. Um, but on the other hand, reducing afterload may, may be uh, beneficial. So I, I would, I'd have difficulty designing that trial. Okay. Michelle, I have one question for you. All of these trials have taken patients with septic shock and they've put them into one bin. Right. But we haven't, I think, separated the patients that have a source controllable lesion from patients that don't have a source controllable lesion. 
How do you think that would impact the data and the recommendations? Oh, look, Professor, I think that's an excellent, um, excellent thought. I think we're moving more and more towards the era of personalized medicine. Um, we've heard from the previous speakers um, about how we should be identifying different phenotypes. You know, there are, if, even within septic shock, there are so many different etiologies, so many different pathophysiological mechanisms. And I think, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice by lumping it all into one category. And even with the trials that have been conducted today, none of them have done an echo prior to studying echo, um, inotropes. And I'm, I'm not sure if all, actually not all trials have restored the mean arterial pressure to whatever, I, I, I hate to say the word normal, but you know, more reasonable, more physiological levels. Because in, in a lot of those patients, by restoring the mean arterial pressure to, uh, to 65 or whatever it is, uh, you may actually unmask a a subgroup, of pop, a subgroup of patients that were not presumed to have cardiac dysfunction. And those patients would have been excluded from these trials. If you had to individualize treatment of cardiogenic shock, we all speak about uh, uh, personalized uh, uh, RCTs. On which criteria would you uh, separate the patients? What is different in cardiogenic shock from one patient one patient to another. Uh, this is this is getting really difficult. I think um, if I had to choose one criteria, I would choose filling pressures. Filling pressures. Yes. The the use of the previous use of beta blockers, perhaps. No? Yes, that that would be a reasonable criteria. The problem being that we don't know how much it downregulates um, beta receptor function. Mm. I think it's individual. And I, I, that can't be measured clinically. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Since we've heard talk about beta blockers, our next speaker is Vasilis Papuanu from Alexandropolis in Greece. Thank you very much. Huh? Good morning, everybody. So too many talks about vasopressors, catecholamines, and who's going to talk and discuss about beta blockers. So, these are my conflicts of interest. We all know that these are the mainstream therapy for septic shock, administration of fluids, catecholamines, and vasopressin. Nevertheless, as Mervyn Singer very elegantly has described, we are actually stuck between the skill of compromised tissue perfusion in septic shock and the high risk of the complications of the first trial treatment. As you can see here, um, this is, What's the pointer? You can see all the potential complications that can be attributed to catecholamines. We have already listened about immunoparalysis, about uh, increased incidence of infections, about clot stabilization, and so on. And we know many studies have already published, have been published, that have shown that increased heart rate is associated with worse outcome in patients with heart failure, in patients with multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, as you can see here. And, and the most important issue here is that the higher the heart rate, higher than 90 per, bits per minute, the more short the time being that the patient will develop <coughs> multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. This is the Microsoft study that was published recently. As you can see from the, from the bar chart, only patients who had microcirculatory dysfunction associated with lactate and increased heart rate at the same time get the worst prognosis and the higher mortality in relation with all other patients. And this is another study from France who showed that patients who needed more than one microgram per kilogram per minute of norepinephrine get increased uh, mortality in relation with those who needed less norepinephrine. So many studies have shown that too much catecholamines is not good for physiology. This is what I'm interested in actually, a bit complicated concept of ventricular arterial coupling. As you can see, I don't know this. So this is the pressure volume loop of the left ventricle. <clears throat> so this line actually, which is between the end diastolic volume and the end systolic uh, pressure is the so-called arterial elastance, which reflects arterial load. And when we're talking about arterial load, we mean both peripheral resistance and compliance of aorta. And this line is actually the uh, ventricular elastance, which is an index of contractility. Based to the classic papers by Suga and Suragao about the ventricular arterial coupling, these two lines have to be in a kind of ratio around one. This means that the efficiency of the cardiac contraction is optimum because this blue area corresponds to the work that is actually consumed by the heart to eject stroke volume, and this 
Second area is the dynamic energy which is stored in the left ventricular wall. So in case you have, an, for instance, a decreased end systolic elastance due to decreased contractility, this area is increased, meaning the work that the heart has to perform in order to eject the same stroke volume is much bigger. And what we know also from the math is that the left ventricular ejection fraction, if you do the math, actually depends on the ratio of those two elastances. So we can have different uh, combinations of end systolic elastance and arterial elastance and have the same even normal left ventricular ejection fraction. Nevertheless, many studies, experimental studies have shown that in sepsis, there is an uncoupling between central artery and peripheral artery. This means that you have at the same time, a decreased end systolic elastance, you decrease contractility in most of the cases, but you have also an increased arterial elastance. And this arterial elastance has been attributed either to increased catecholamine levels, this is also very nicely have been shown by a Spanish group who's shown that the norepinephrine increases the backward flow of the waves as blood pressure waves uh, travel towards the periphery. To the branches of the arterial network, there are some backward flow and all these pressure waves return back to the heart and this is how actually pulse pressure is created. So norepinephrine, high dose of norepinephrine, increase the velocity of this return and this increases the pulse pressure and finally the arterial load. Apart from catecholamines, different experimental studies have shown that uh, and dotoxin per se can also decrease availability of a no at the level of central aorta, and this can increase arterial elastance, meaning ventricular arterial coupling, meaning a lot of uh, energy consumed for the same stroke volume. Uh, and this is an experimental study, a very nice experimental study. Marta Carrera is from Milan, has many, many publications in experimental studies uh, in patients with inpatients, in rabbits and dogs with uh, septic shock, and they have evaluated arterial compliance and peripheral resistance using different mathematical models. As you can see here, T1 is baseline, T2 is after the onset of septic shock, and T4 is after resuscitation with fluids and vasopressors. And you can see here the blue box is the arterial compliance, and the orange is the peripheral resistance. You can see here how both compliance and resistance are reduced, and what is really important is after administration of vasopressors, norepinephrine, vasopressin, and fluids, it remains reduced, both peripheral resistance and arterial elastance. You can see here the pulse pressure, which normally increases from the central aorta towards the periphery. This is actually the opposite that takes place even after 40, 48 hours of resuscitation. And what is important in my point of view is that this time constant, the aortic time constant, meaning the product of compliance and resistance, when it is reduced, meaning reduced compliance, reduced resistance, this is associated with reduced baroreflex sensitivity. And baroreflex sensitivity is actually a measure of autonomic nervous system function. And we know from many, many studies based on critical care medicine and cardiovascular literature that the autonomic nervous system dysfunction is a very significant prognostic marker and is associated with more Mortality. Uh, so the classic question, it has been raised many years ago, to beta stimulate the heart in order to improve tissue perfusion and increase oxygen delivery in case that microcirculation is okay, or to beta blockade and protect oxygen, uh, myocardium consumption, oxygen consumption, and decrease in general cellular oxygen needs. Uh, so the theory is pretty much easy. If we beta blockade the patient, you attenuate cardiac dysfunction, you improve coagulation disorders, if you reduce cytokine production, as has been shown in many studies, you can normalize this hypermetabolic state, and also many studies have shown that you can prevent lymphocyte apoptosis. Uh, this is the first study, actually, was published many, many years ago by Burke, who showed in uh, experimental models that when you, you, you give propranolol in, in endotoxic shock uh, dogs, you actually ameliorate oxygenation, uh, you decrease dead space ventilation, and all this because you decrease VQ inequalities due to the uh, decrease of the arterial venous shunts that are produced by the endotoxin administration. Uh, this is another experimental study. There are many experimental studies. We'll show only two by Suzuki who showed in experimental models by using esmolol the decrease in all the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the most important, they found that was an upregulation of the beta-1 receptors of the cardiac tissue by the administration of esmolol. Also, the ventricular arterial coupling seemed to be ameliorized, optimized, because cardiac efficiency, the work that was spent by the heart to produce, to eject the same stroke volume, was very much improved. This is another classic study from Japan by Landiolol, where they actually found that the use of Landiolol in the toxic shock reduced inflammation at the level of the lung, reduced different cytokines, and also the induction of NF-kappa-B. This recent study by Esmolol, an experimental model, who actually found that the administration of Esmolol 
in, just an increase in the vagal tone. And vagal tone is very important to assess autonomic nervous dysfunction. If we consider that heart rate, increased heart rate, is not balanced, it's, not, it's actually a maladaptation due to autonomic nervous system dysfunction, and this has been shown by the studies that I showed, to, I showed you before with the reduction of uh, barolemic sensitivity, this increase in vagal tone means that actually autonomic nervous system dysfunction seems to get ameliorated and there is like less sympathetic overstimulation. Uh, studies, clinical studies by the chronic use of VITA blockers. This is a classic study by Mai Chia who showed in many, many thousands of patients who were under VITA blocker before their admission to ICU, their 80-day 80 80 day mortality was very much, very much in decreased 77% versus the patients who did not receive VITA blockers before ICU admission. Uh, the most recent study is the BIS trial, which actually found that similar results, but this actually included non-selective VITA blockers, patients who were under non-selective VITA blockers had significantly increased survival irrespectively of any cause of admission in the ICU in relation with those who did not actually have, were under VITA blockers. And what was really important here is that the SOFA score seemed to be increased, particularly, decreased, sorry, particularly the respiratory and the neurological. And let's come to Morelli, uh, who published a paper with 45 patients a few years ago and showed that based on the analysis of the arterial waveform, uh, elastans, arterial elastans, because ventricular elastans was not measured, was significantly increased, uh, decreased, uh, I'm sorry, increased uh, in patients who were under esmolol. Left ventricular ejection fraction was increased, contractility was increased. And so what has happened actually? We know by basic physiology that if you give VITA blockers, you can decrease theoretically the end systolic elastans, but you can prolong the time of the diastolic filling. And so stroke volume can be theoretically unchanged. Uh, and according to Morelli, in this paper, you can see this increased pulse pressure who seems to be decreased after the esmolar administration, and the authors thought that this could be due to the increased stroke volume, which induces an increase in vascular tone, and th they thought that this in actually reflects a better ventricular arterial coupling. However, Jacques de Becker had some issues about the analysis because he thought that since left ventricular ejection fraction was unchanged in all of these patients, despite the increase in cardiac output or stroke volume, this seems, according to what we show based on the elastance ratio, that ventricular arterial coupling was not actually affected. The other problem is Morelli was actually using peripheral arterial waveforms and not the central aorta waveforms, which are necessary to understand what is going on with the arterial elastance and not peripheral resistance. Uh, so Morelli came back a few years later and reanalyzed his data uh, from the previous paper, and he found that the difference between the systolic blood pressure and the crotic pressure was, uh, with a threshold of 35 millimeters per mercury, was actually the basic indicator to s tell you if heart rate increase was uh, a normal response to volume depletion or it was a maladaptation, which is actually the most important question, if we have to decrease heart rate or not. So based on his analysis, patients who actually had higher than 35 millimeters per mercury of this difference in systolic versus decrotic pressure, which actually difference did not change after four hours of esmolol administration, they had the better decrease in elastance and the better increase in contractility. Nevertheless, the other group of patients who had lower pressure difference between systolic plus pressure and decrotic, and this difference decreased during time after esmolol administration, they had decreased contractility. And according to the authors, this actually phenomena correlate with what happens in relation with afterload, because the higher difference actually tells us, according to Morel at least, that the contractility of the heart is very good for the arterial load that is imposed. And in this case, heart rate is not an adaptative response. Nevertheless, in the other case, when the systolic pressure is decreased in relation with the crotic pressure, this means that the contractility is not that good optimized in relation with the arterial load that is imposed. And when this is decreased after arousal administration, this means actually that the patient needs more sympathetic tone in order to cooperate with these guys. So, what about Magder? Uh, in this paper, which is pretty difficult to understand, he shows that we have to always take into account contractility and venous return. Because we know that if venous return this is the venous return curve, this is the Frank Stalin curve, and this is the cardiac output on the C axis and the CVP on the X axis. If, for instance, the patient is underfilled or if, for instance, the patient is vasodilated, this venous return curve is towards to the left. And, of course, if the intrathoracic pressure is very much increased, then this Frank Stalin curve can intersect at the flat part of the venous return curve, meaning that any increase with heart rate 
will not increase cardiac output, meaning it will decrease stroke volume. But the other way, if we have a lower contractility, in this case, if we increase the heart rate, we will not change cardiac output. In this case, so we have always taken into account intrathoracic pressure, volume status, and contractility. Uh, this is a meta-analysis that was published two years ago. It included six randomized control trials, Morelli study and the Kakinaka study that was published recently in relation with Langdolol uh, in septic shock patients. And all these studies, apart from different secondary outcomes, found a significant mortality, uh, absolute risk reduction, and the numbers needed to be prevented over 5.5. So this 18.2% uh, absolute risk reduction means that VITA blockers can theoretically work on average. Nevertheless, all these studies are not, have very limited sample size and a lot of uh, pitfalls in terms of statistics. But nevertheless, it's a fair signal. And there is one more, and based on this meta-analysis, Morelli said, if we are at, this, at the right path, yes, we are on the right path if we think that we should correct heart rate increase after filling the tank, okay? And this means approximately 24 hours of volume administration. After evaluating the the amount of heart rate, if the patient is too tachycardic, we have to go very slowly. And of course, the best number maybe should be below 95 beats per minute. And this is the ESMO study, ESMO sepsis study, which actually included a, li a little number of patients who showed that the use of uh, ESMOLOL in uh, very early, the first six hours administration, deteriorated actually all hemodynamic variables and of course decreased all inflammatory markers. So early administration of VITA blockers in underfilled patients is something that we should avoid uh, as much as possible. And this is the last uh, meta-analysis that was published recently and actually shows it was more randomized controlled trials and showed only, not only patients with septic shock, but also neurosurgical patients, general surgery patients, burn patients, who also found a significant uh, decrease in mortality, and particularly long-term mortality, meaning more than 14 days. This is the signal of this analysis, not the short-term mortality. So, in conclusions, VITA blockers, yes, based on physiology, they can maintain stroke volume, they can reduce norepinephrine requirements, they can reduce potentially arterial stiffening, and ameliorate ventricular arterial coupling. Yes, they have anti-inflammatory effects. We know that for many studies. They can restore sympathetic parasitic balance, anus dysfunction. And I remind you, <clears throat> this is the story of VITA blockers. And I remind you, this paper was published in 1979. This is the first indication of use of VITA blockers in congestive cardiomyopathy. And it took approximately two years from the, from the cardiology literature to and the cardiology uh, guys to accept the theory of VITA blockers in, congestive heart failure. So I think maybe we should be more uh, accurate and more fast in our decisions. Thank you very much for your attention. So I'm glad your last slide had a heart on it because a lot of the patients that we deal with are either post-cardiac surgery or post-non-cardiac thoracic surgery. And everyone is concerned about the development of new atrial dysrhythmia. And some of the thoracic, uh, Society of Thoracic Surgery guidelines suggest amiodarone as a empiric agent to apply. Am I likely to get the same kind of benefit using amiodarone as it hits some of the beta blocker receptors as if I use Esmolol? Well, it depends. Uh, the studies I'm aware of have shown that uh, selective vitana blockers reduce earlier heart rate, but this signal is lost at least six or nine hours after. So it depends on if you want to reduce early heart rate or not, at least based on the recent literature. Do I, do I want to reduce early heart rate? It depends. <laughs> what do you do? Actually, uh, you have to combine many physiologic measurements and many physiologic parameters to understand what is going on with the circulation. In my view, we have to perform an echocardiography to evaluate if the patient has a hyperkinetic profile or a hypokinetic profile, because in this case, we have a huge vasoparalysis, and in this case, maybe a VITA blocker could work. Another index that I'm trying to evaluate is the diastolic shock index, because we know a lot about systolic shock index, the heart rate divided by diastolic pressure, and there are some studies that have shown that the higher the diastolic shock index, the worse the mortality, and this means actually that when you have increased heart rate and you have low diastolic pressure, it means that you have a huge vasoparalysis, a huge vasodilatation, and this maybe could be a marker to evaluate the effect of uh, VITA blockers on the outcome and uh, the hemodynamic uh, optimi optimization of the patient. 
in theory, a pure decrease in heart rate induced by evabradin, for instance, an IF channel inhibitor, um, should be as potent as a beta blocker, or there are other modes of actions for beta blockers than a reduction in heart rate. Evabradin doesn't have immunomodulatory effects. It has been shown that it can also reduce heart rate, but I think the the multiple effects of beta blockers in different parts of uh, cardiovascular physiology and immuno uh, response makes them best candidate in relation with abradin. That's my point of view. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks again. <laughs> the next speaker uh, will be uh, Hannah Wunsch from Toronto, Canada. She'll speak about continuing controversies. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Um, thanks for staying through this marathon session. I've been given a talk title which could encompass the entire session. Uh, I am not going to do that. And uh, what I've decided to focus on is something that I think hasn't really been addressed but has been uh, talked about peripherally, which is blood pressure targets and the controversy around uh, how to approach that in dealing with vasopressors. Um, should I just mention I have uh, various funding, nothing uh, related to this talk. So going back to a very traditional model of shock, which I think even after all of this discussion we haven't really gotten away from, which is that we diagnose hypotension, we fluid resuscitate to some degree, we decide the blood pressure is still too low for our liking, and so we start vasopressors, right? Kind of simple model, uh, but unfortunately, for better or worse, still what we tend to do. Now, when I start a vasopressor, for all the gadgets and gizmos and things we can measure out there, fundamentally, I start something, usually norepinephrine, and the nurse I'm working with will say to me, what's my blood pressure target, right? Uh, and I think that certainly in places where they have less access to fancy devices to measure uh, things, I recognize things like capillary refill is not a fancy measurement, but uh, fundamentally, this is still our kind of uh, standard of care is to choose a blood pressure target and to go with it. Now, there's lots of other potential questions we can ask, but obviously this is one of this long list of things that we've been talking about today. Now, can go back, there's lots of studies that have looked at this. This is obviously one of the big ones that came out back now in 2014, looking at high versus lower blood pressure targets for patients specifically with septic shock. Uh, they had actually nice separation in the two groups in terms of reaching those blood pressure targets. However, I think it's really important to point something out here. This gray bar represents the high blood pressure target, and this gray bar way down, you can kind of, I'm not sure how well you can see it down there, it's below the y-axis, represents the low blood pressure target. And I think this speaks to fundamental human nature. It's very, very, very hard to get people to target things in the mid to low range of whatever your target is, right? The, the human nature is to wish to sort of keep them on the higher edge and keep a buffer there. And you'll see this over and over again, that whatever we ask people to target, they tend to target a little bit higher. Now this was what is usually referred to as a negative study, but really no difference between these outcomes. On the one hand, you could say this is reassuring. It means that I can kind of pick my target and it probably won't make a difference. Um, but their mortality, their primary outcome at death at 28 days was 34% versus 36.6%, no difference. Um, now a colleague in Canada, Francois Le Montagne, with a group uh, took these data and pooled it with some Canadian preliminary data also looking at blood pressure targets. And they came up with a hypothesis trying to figure out who might actually benefit. And uh, they have this graph, and I always sort of have to take myself through this. On the age is on the x-axis there. Y-axis is the odds ratio for benefit from being in the lower blood pressure group. And the odds ratio greater than one favored being at the lower blood pressure target. So what this showed and sort of created the hypothesis that in fact, well, may, we may not understand why, but it seemed that those who were older, greater than the age of 65, seemed to potentially show a signal for benefit from the lower blood pressure target. So this led to one of the next big trials, which was the 65 trial that was published just back in, in 2020. Now I want to draw your attention to the title of this paper, Effective Reduced Exposure to Vasopressors on 90-Day Mortality. Right, so odd that it doesn't say higher versus lower blood pressure targets. Now the two are obviously incredibly intertwined, but they are slightly different concepts. 
Are you actually trying to reach a lower blood pressure? And is that in and of itself a useful concept? Or are you actually just trying to reduce the amount of vasopressor, and is the vasopressor itself toxic in ways unrelated to the blood pressure? So just important to recognize when you read this literature that people kind of sometimes equate the two, sometimes separate the two, um, and we don't really have good answers, back to continuing controversies, as to which one is actually the relevant piece. Now, this was also a study that uh, essentially showed no big difference between uh, patients in the higher versus lower blood pressure groups. I want to call your attention, though, to the same issue. This is their separation between groups. And this is where they were, in theory, targeting for their lower blood pressure group. So they got some separation, but again, trying to get people to run the blood pressure with a map of 60 is something that most people fundamentally, they look at the monitor and it makes them uncomfortable, they kind of up it a little bit. And I would argue that probably this is one area where our best bet, unfortunately, is going to be some, some computerized loop system, right, where we take humans out of this and say, we don't care how scary that looks. We're programming it to set the map at 60, and the computer will titrate the medication to keep the map at 60, because I'm not sure as humans we're ever going to get there. Um, just looking at their subgroups, there are, again, no big differences in the subgroups as we try to figure out who's actually going to maybe benefit from this approach if it's not kind of everybody. There was an interesting signal for those with chronic hypertension, not the group that I would have expected to potentially benefit most or benefit at all from a, a low blood pressure target, but that's the group that, at least in this study, seemed to show some benefit. I don't have a good physiologic explanation for that. However, I think one thing that's missing from all of these studies and one thing that kind of is a theme of all of the discussions today is this issue of individualized, personalized medicine. Now, there's lots of things we could personalize about approach to blood pressure, but fundamentally, one of the big ones that we don't talk too much about is baseline blood pressure. What is that person actually living with day to day, and how does that relate to how they're going to respond or how much vasopressor they need or what map target they actually need. So we actually set out to try to just begin to chip away at this question a little bit, and we had the question of how does baseline blood pressure impact delivery of vasopressors. Now, we had a very simple hypothesis, which was that patients with low baseline blood pressure remain on vasopressors for longer. We weren't trying to prove that uh, you know, one approach is, is better than another in terms of what patient's blood pressure was at baseline. This was retrospective data. But I'm sure you've all been in that situation where someone is on vasopressors, you try to turn it off, their blood pressure pressure is 90 over 50, the nurse turns it back on, it goes up to 120 over 80, and you go through this cycle until finally you sort of say, just leave them at 90 over 50, as long as, you know, they're not dizzy, that's fine, and you send them out that way. And then, of course, sometimes you also learn later that actually they live at 90 over 50, and you've been kind of chasing your tail this whole time. So that was essentially our hypothesis, was that because we don't take into account someone's baseline blood pressure, that we tend to leave people on vasopressors longer if they're going to kind of sag their pressure below what we consider normal when we take them off vasopressors. To do this, we use data from four ICUs in Calgary. Um, you can imagine trying to find data that gives us that detailed in-ICU data plus information about patients' baseline blood pressure is challenging. Um, we took patients with shock, so this was not just septic shock admitted to an ICU, and we determined their average, what we called baseline blood pressure, from all prior hospitalizations and outpatient encounters that had a measurement of blood pressure. Again, not perfect, because of course hospitalizations, prior hospitalizations may give you lower or higher blood pressure depending on uh, what was going on, but certainly better than what we normally have, which is kind of nothing when someone rolls into the ICU. So what did we find? Well, we divided our patients into baseline low, normal, and high. And the first thing we found was that for the duration of time people were on vasopressors, that their blood pressure was being run at their baseline blood pressure if they were in the low blood pressure group. So our vasopressor goal was their baseline blood pressure. Now, of course, this was not true as we got into patients with baseline blood pressure that's normal. We actually tended, even on vasopressors, to run them about 10 to 20 millimeters mercury below. And for those who were hypertensive, we run them 30 to 40 below. So we are, you know, not surprisingly, everybody's being targeted to the same map. So of course, if your baseline map is different, you're going to see uh, different relative to your baseline. 
Then we actually confirmed our hypothesis. So this is time to discontinuation of vasopressors. And for those in the low baseline group, the time to discontinuation was longer. It's a little hard to look at it as a kind of Kaplan-Meier type curve. So we also quantified this. And we have the, the easiest number to look at there is in the bottom. Fifth, the time for 50% of patients to be off vasopressors was 1.88 days for those in the low blood pressure group versus 1.3 and 1.2 in the normal and high groups. So just suggesting, you know, doesn't tell you anything about outcomes, doesn't say this is necessarily good or bad, but does suggest, of course, that if we could incorporate baseline blood pressure, maybe some of those patients at least might have come off their vasopressors earlier. We're not the only ones to be looking at this. This is a study that came out in the Blue Journal back in 2020. Um, they used what they called the basal MPP, which was essentially, again, the baseline map, but they incorporated measurement of CVP if they had it. Um, I would argue that for most people, this was essentially equivalent to looking at the map. And they were interested in the same kind of concept, what they called MPP deficit. So the time that someone who was in the ICU in shock uh, was being at, was run at a blood pressure that was about 20% below their basal MPP. And then they were looking at AKI there on the left side and MAKE, which is major adverse kidney events, on the right side. And you can see as the time weighted average, the time they spent at this with this deficit in blood pressure went up, the there was an increased incidence of AKI and make. But interestingly, the one time that they didn't see this tight relationship was when they just looked at time below a map of 65. So really kind of adds the idea that maybe incorporating and understanding how far you off someone's baseline blood pressure in some way makes a difference. So kind of recognizing this is just scratching the surface, um, as all of these talks are, because it's very clear we know very little about how best to titrate vasopressors. But I would argue we do need to start somewhere. Um, just to give you a sense of how all over the place we are, this is work that was published by uh, Nick Bosch at Boston University just last year, where we looked at what is the actual dose that people start vasopressin at in each ICU uh, in the US in a sample. And you can see it's all over the place. The x-axis there is different hospitals, and the y-axis is the norepinephrine dose in micrograms per minute at which the average patient was started on vasopressin. So we have a lot we don't agree on um, and uh, a lot to go, but I hope that I've kind of given you food for thought in terms of a very simple thing to at least start to think about incorporating. Um, so in conclusion, there are many unknown, unknowns, and I think it's important to start at least considering people's baseline blood pressure. Now, I haven't given you a lot to tell you exactly what to do with that baseline blood pressure, but I think that the more we begin to think about it, the more that, uh, you know, kind of simple things like recognizing when you're running someone actually above their baseline at 130 over 80, when they actually live at 90 over 60, the more we can sort of incrementally improve our titration of vasopressors. And and I would put to you, you know, when someone's doing a presentation about a new patient, they'll tell you they have diabetes, they'll tell you their age. They don't generally tell you what is their baseline blood pressure. They might tell you they're hypertensive or they're not, but they don't give you more detail than that. If you work in a surgical ICU like I do, you often have the benefit of at least that preoperative blood pressure that was measured, which again may have white coat syndrome and may or may not be accurate, but gives you something. I recognize often you're, you're blind, but it's amazing how many patients and family members actually know what their baseline blood pressure is if you take the time to ask them. So I would suggest that that's at least a place to start. So I'm gonna stop there, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You, you mentioned the, uh, the role of previews uh, of the baseline level of uh, blood pressure. I think in my practice, it's also an issue of the previous administration of antihypertensive drugs. And um, it's, it's funny that it's not been that much studied. The, and we all see that uh, in many patients, we give norepinephrine just because these uh, drugs have been accumulated, uh, at least initially, in septic shock. Do you think that uh, we may observe the same results when considering previous administration of antihypertensive drugs, as you observed? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, and I think, you know, kind of to tease apart all our different groups 
is important because we have people who aren't on anything, right, and their just natural blood pressure is either low, moderate, or high, their hypertensive baseline, and then we have people who are treated hypertensives. Um, and, you know, that slide I showed you about uh, hypertension versus no in the 65 trial, it doesn't tell you whether they were treated hypertensives or not, just as they have a diagnosis of hypertension, right? And of course, to your point, those are very different in terms of people who have drug on board and uh, in two ways. One is that you may or may not need to be counteracting the drug itself, and ACE inhibitors being the classic, certainly in surgery, where mm -hmm. the blood pressure plummets. Um, but the other is just then, what is their body used to seeing? And so they may be hypertensive, but they've been living at a blood pressure of 120 over, over 80 because they're on appropriate antihypertensives. So I think any studies going forward need to sort of be asking those questions in figuring out and incorporating that baseline information into it. Um, I do know, I think there's a big Australian study actually that is currently or is about to enroll patients to really try to get a little bit at this question of baseline blood pressure and, and how it interacts. Um, but yes, the, the interaction with drugs is a whole other issue. Earlier in your presentation, you had a slide that identified older patients as benefiting from a lower blood pressure target. Can you help me reconcile that with a patient-centered outcome of neurocognitive success as opposed to neurocognitive failure? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a head-scratcher, um, and I think to your point, we still fixate on mortality, and uh, the ability to keep someone alive is not actually sometimes helpful if we're damaging other things and causing delirium and, and such. Um, I, I don't know other than that, you know, when we give drugs to increase blood pressure, they are drugs in the system, they're interacting with other drugs, uh, vasopressors are, you know, just as much of a concern, or maybe not as much of a concern, but are a concern in terms of what effect they may have, and that goes back to my point about the 65 trial, where their framing of it was around reducing exposure to vasopressors. Um, I don't, you know, I'm throwing up my hands because I don't have an answer mechanistically as to why uh, that might be beneficial in the elderly and why I might, you know, for instance, uh, it might be protective or not for cognitive dysfunction. I don't know. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Thank Hannah. And finally, the thing that you've heard about, refractory septic shock from Ricard Ferrer. You will close out our session. So I will take advantage of that because I think many things have been said. So I think I can go straight to some, some of the points of this, uh, of this discussion. Thank you for the introduction. Those are my conflicts of interest. So you, you have seen here a lot of improvements in fluids and vasopressors uh, management. So I think this is part of the improvement we have in the recent years. However, we don't have improvements in new sepsis treatment, despite also we have improved a lot in knowing specific phenotypes. And in part, I think that is not only related to the phenotypes, it's because we don't have a specific definition, but we can consider refractory septic shock. In fact, most of the studies that has been presented here have different inclusion exclusion criteria and different concepts like uh, uh, resistant to catecholamines, refractory septic shock, so similar concepts trying to select those patients that are in fact not responding to the standard therapy. And we are in the era of precision medicine, so I think or we think that we have to be very precise in what we consider refractory septic shock because are the patients that we think are the target for some therapies that uh, may uh, those patients uh, deserve uh, a treatment. So this is the last uh, consensus conference on, of, on the definition of sepsis and the consensus conference or the clinical criteria for diagnosis or classifying a patient as septic shock is the presence of hypotension refractory to fluids, the use of vasopressors and lactate above two. And this definition was achieved not, not because a physiopathological rationale is because this is a group of patients with the highest mortality above 40%. But what about patients with refractory septic shock? Well, refractory to the standard measures, probably the mortality, sure the mortality is higher, but we don't have criteria for having an homogeneous group of patients. So if we don't have diagnostic criteria or um, a definition for that, it's very difficult to know which is the epidemiology which is the epidemiology of refractory septic shock, is unknown, which is the current practice. We cannot know who is doing uh, blood purification or any uh, rescue therapy based 
in that because uh, we don't have uh, an homogeneous group of patients. And also it's difficult to design trials and to assess specific treatments if we don't have the definition. So this is my main concern for this session. And the rest of the talk I'm going to spend just to establish which is the current practice or the most accepted practice we can include in this refractory septic shock definition. Of course, we have to go for patients that have the adequate fluid resuscitation. And of course, the adequate fluid resuscitation is not a fixed number because a fixed number is not able to increase the intravascular volume, increase venous return, cardiac preload, cardiac output, and oxygen delivery uh, to all type of patients. So of course, there is not a fixed number. And we have many limitations because, again, there is uh, uh, variability in the vascular permeability and the amount of uh, interstitial edema that will be produced by this fluid resuscitation. But it's clear that the uh, uh, fluid overload is associated, is independently associated to higher mortality. So this precision between not keeping the patient hypovolemic and hypoperfuse and not going for hypervolemia and uh, excessive edema, both of them are associated with high mortality, with higher mortality. We have to go for this precision situation where uh, the preload is optimized for the best um, systolic volume or stroke volume and then uh, cardiac output. And uh, I think it's also uh, wise to cite your chairman because uh, then the questions are will be maybe we're going to be not so tough. So maybe we can set, based on this algorithm that I'm not going to discuss now, that we can consider that the patient is optimized when, we, uh, when the patient is preload and responsive. It's not responding or have not dynamic tests showing that the patient will respond to fluids. So we can say that this is the standard therapy accepted uh, right now and the guidelines are concordant in that, that uh, when we achieve this point, the patient is evolemic and resuscitation has been finished. However, uh, the trend uh, is to start with vasopressor early because there is uh, many physiological reasons not to wait until the patient is completely resuscitated in certain situations because vasopressors can increase um, uh, um, mean systemic pressure uh, faster than only with fluids, also correct hypoten hypotension uh, faster, limit the fluid overloads, limit the, the, the hemodilution, and then may may increase the, the improve the outcome. However, there is not also a clear definition what means early. In this meta-analysis, the concept early is different according to different studies, as you can see here. But as a result, it seems that early, maybe merely early is simultaneous, so not to finish uh, fluid resuscitation means a better outcome. And in fact, again, the guidelines recognize that and said that uh, vasopressors can be or should be initiated in patients with persistent hypotension uh, after or during fluid resuscitation. Which vasopressors, and I also I think it's wise to cite the speakers in the room for saying that the first vasopressor is norepinephrine, and this is, was very nicely demonstrated by uh, Hannah Wush in this observational study. And again, it's limitations because it's observational, but I think uh, it's a very interesting approach to use a shortage period of norepinephrine and to look what vasopressor has substituted uh, norepinephrine. Of course, angiotensin II was uh, not there, so there's uh, a limitation, but there is an increase in mortality during this period in those hospitals that have this shortage of norepinephrine and um, substitute norepinephrine by other vasopressors. So it's indirecting evidence that uh, uh, norepinephrine is the first vasopressor and it has been uh, recognized also in the guidelines. So when we consider a patient that is refractory to, to, to norepinephrine, again, there is not consensus. If you check which is the dose of norepinephrine that uh, se several investigators consider that is the threshold for starting a second vasopressor, for example, you can see here a huge variability from 0 to 0.25 up to 4 mics per kilo a minute. And many of them do not state which is the form of norepinephrine, if they are talking about norepinephrine base or they are talking about beta trade, which is half of the dose of norepinephrine base. So a huge variability here, and again, I think we need a consensus for that. 
too much in order to finish that. We heard a lot about this during this session. I want to cite one of the seminal papers on that because this is the first time I heard about that and was the paper of Claude Martin and Mark Leone uh, talking about that and showing that patients that receive very high dose of norepinephrine, norepinephrine by itself is an independent risk factor for mortality. But again, the dose uh, that is risky for the patient is not very well established. But this is the starting point for talking about this decatecholimization strategies that include many strategies that are just taking care of the patient in the right way, like to optimize the dose of sedation of analgesia to provide inotropes if the, if the cardiac output is low, and to consider alternative drugs. I just am going to mention uh, hydrocortisone that, again, I think should be part of a standard of care because these both trials have different outcome in terms of mortality, but they are very concordant in the time to reduction of vasopressor. So it's an interesting strategy to reduce the cytokine load using hydrocortisone to reduce uh, the duration of the vasopressors. So again, this is uh, well recognized in the guidelines. And again, vasopressin, you have seen this slide many times this morning, so I don't have to insist in that. And also I want to insist that regarding that the outcome of this trial is negative in terms of mortality, again, the reduction of the dose of norepinephrine was uh, faster achieved in the patients randomized to vasopressin in the VAS trial. So again, it seems a good, a good strategy, and in the meta-analysis of the Shrine Sepsis Campaign Systematic Review, found a difference in mortality and no difference in renal prevention, but you have seen many other um, meta-analyses during this uh, session with different results. Anyway, the Shrine Sepsis Campaign recommend to combine with a second vasopressor, vasopressin, when the dose of norepinephrine is zero, in between 0 0.25 and 0 0.5 mics per kilo per minute. So, my conclusion would be that the standard of care could be to optimize fluid resuscitation until the eubolemic stay, let's say when the patient is not anymore a fluid responder, the patient persists hypotensive and um, hypoperfuse, and we are combining two vasopressors plus hydrocortisone. I would say that this is standard of care. This group of patients, if they are not responding to that, we can consider those patients refractory. We did a systematic review on that. It was published a few weeks ago. And those are the list of definitions we have for refractory septic shock. And these are the dose of norepinephrine we found in the different studies we include in this uh, systematic review. A lot of heterogeneity and a lot of different concepts mixed together. Catecholamine resistant, refractory septic shock, high dose of norepinephrine, I want to remind you that catecholamine resistance is different to, uh, because it's only a small part of what we consider refractory septic shock, but a lot of variability. So we think, and we conclude in our, in our uh, systematic review, that we need to have a consensus definition for that because it will help to have a good epidemiology a good, um, and a good base for uh, designing trials and select patients for the trials. Thank you for your attention. Allow me to describe a patient for you. Mm -hmm. Emergency general surgery, mechanically ventilated, started on norepinephrine, added vasopressin, has a point of care ultrasound that suggests their ventricle is full, their vena cava does not collapse, they're still hypotensive, and we add epinephrine. They're at what our institution maximal doses are for those three agents. We've added hydrocortisone earlier. What do we do now? For me, that's a refractory septic shock patient. Where do I go? So uh, first is the standard of care. So you have to be sure. I think secondary analysis of those patients, secondary review of those patients are very important to check about the antibiotic is appropriate, source control is adequate, et cetera, et cetera. It seems that hemodynamic is optimized because uh, the patient is uh, optimized in terms of um, uh, adequate fluid status and uh, an adequate mix of uh, a cocktail of vasopressors, then I think it's, uh, it's time to assess other therapies. Uh, maybe patient can be considered for vitamin C treatment. Maybe the patient can be considered, uh, considered to methylene blue. Maybe we can consider the patient for blood purification. Uh, so I think this is quite depending from center to center, but we don't have really, really a 
photography, which is the current practice in different centers because there is a lot of variability because it's an open, it's an open question. In my center, what we are doing? We are doing vitamin C. We are doing uh, an inflammatory profile of the patient, and if the patient high, high levels of cytokines, high level of endotoxin, we will target the perfusion according to that measurements. And uh, yeah, that's it. After your uh, systematic review, you think we would need a consensus on the definition on refractory, septic, and cardiogenic shock? Yeah, of course, for sure, I think. And by the way, you think it should be the same definition in sepsis and cardiogenic shock? Or are there arguments for defining that differently? I think... Uh, I, I don't know at all. It's yeah. A, uh, I'm not sure about that. I have not think about that because I am too focused in sepsis mm. that uh, I didn't uh, think about uh, cardiogenic shock. But uh, but it, but it, but it makes sense that can be that can be together. It's all. then there's the ECMO part also. I mean, uh, sure. uh, there's the... the ECMO part that uh, I think for those patients, if they have cardiogenic shock or severe myocardial dysfunction, ECMO support is much more clear. But for those patients that do not have this uh, cardiogenic involvement, it's not so clear. So again, it's a subgroup of patients that can be, that can be assessed. Thank you very much again, Ricard.